before I have Melanie do her welcome, I would like uh, to record all the other people in the room, everything from our attorney to the guests. Peter, if you could do that. Kathleen, your check, our attorney. Thank you. Con. Uh, Con um, from France. Dennis King. Dennis King. Behind you, Foster. Oh, Foster. That was I, 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 I don't, <laughs> don't forget Amy. And Jeff. Grant Weiss. Chief, Chief Administrative Officer. Peter. Yeah, baby. I, 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 okay, and in addition, we have members of the public who are watching. Now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Melanie Rogers. Hi, I'm Melanie Rogers. I just want to welcome everyone to the this year's uh, board meeting, joint board meeting for APS, APRL. We're glad you can join us today. Thank you for supporting the library. Then next we move to approval of minutes, which have been previously distributed. Um, so there are three different ways we need to vote. First, we need to vote on joint meetings uh, voted on by each board. Then we need to vote APS board only on APS minutes, and then APRL board will vote on APRL only minutes. Um, if anyone has anything they'd like to say or corrections to be made before we just go through this formality, would you please uh, make your remarks now? Okay, then first the joint meeting I'm first talking to the APS board. I would like for the November 3rd meeting held at Arrow Philately. I would like a motion in a second to approve those minutes. Liz makes the motion. Second. Greg makes the second. All those in favor of those minutes, please say aye, raise your hand. Aye. Anyone opposed? So those passed unanimously. And now I turn it over to uh, Melanie for the APRL. Yeah, this is a motion to um, have the Minutes from the joint meeting from November 3rd, 2022, at the Flatley Show. Um, do I have an APRL board member make the motion? So moved. Thank you. Do we have a second? Uh, Rich did a little bit. Rich. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Murray is pointing out that his name is missing from the minutes. So approve them with that correction. I have second. So Right. I, I haven't abstained. Did you want to right. Right. Um, the vote is now for the APRL board to approve the minutes with the amendment to add Murray to the minutes. Um, all in favor? Yes. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Okay, it's unanimous with Jean Epstein. Thank you. Um, next, the APS Board of Directors only meetings. We have March 23rd in St. Louis, April 3rd online, June 12th in electronic vote, and June 15th in electronic vote. Can I get a motion and second to approve those? I have Mark uh, making the motion and Yamil seconding. Any further notes or corrections? All those in favor of those minutes, please say aye. 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 And Okay, those pass unanimously. Now I turn it back to Melanie. Okay, the next minutes that need to be approved are from April 18, 2023, the APRL Board of Trustees. Um, do I have the motion to approve the minutes? Hey, with the spelling check on. I'm there, but I'm there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I have a motion by Tony, seconded by Marie. Um, any further discussion besides updating Murray's <laughs> the name spelling of Murray's name? At least I made it part of it. <laughs> um, all in favor of approving the minutes with correcting the spelling of Murray's name. Aye. Can I do I vote on this because I was eliminated? Yes, but you were also sworn. Okay. Uh, any opposed? Okay, the minutes are approved. Thank you. 
Now we move to the section of our agenda that is reports. Our first report is from our society attorney, Kathleen Yurchuk. Yes, my name is spelled correctly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Cheryl. And um, it's good to see everyone here. It's great turnout uh, since uh, St. Louis. If you recall, one of the issues on the agenda that Scott, Scott English mentioned in St. Louis is now, now that we're over the crisis of COVID, we want to get back to policies and performance. See what we can do to review our policies. It's been a long time, employee policies, items like that, and performance, how we can look at what we're doing and improve it from a legal aspect. So I, I think successfully Jeff and I have been looking at that with several things. Retirement policies haven't been updated in decades. Make sure they're consistent with what we're doing. The leases uh, haven't been updated. Rick, Rick Banks, if you remember him, um, had taken charge of the lease and they needed some updates. For example, um, when, when Rick was doing the leases, we didn't worry about this thing called inflation. Um, and many of the leases didn't have cost of living adjustments. So in reviewing the leases, Jeff and I have been working to make sure that anybody that gets renewals have, have financially sound cost of living adjustments in that, very important. Um, so the focus has been on that, some employee policies that Scott English and I are working on to update those based upon you know, people wanting to work from home or longer extended sick leave. So those are in the works, they're not formalized yet, but we've been progressing in that respect. Otherwise, I think things are, are pretty stable and I think we're going in a positive direction by looking at how to improve things rather than being in a crisis. Any questions? Yeah. Is there any pending litigation or? Uh, uh, our, <laughs> a Saturday's meeting. <laughs> Wait till Saturday, I know. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. There's no pending litigation. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, next, we have the APS APRL Treasurer's Report from Kathy Johnson. All right. Years ago, I was your treasurer, and a big old PowerPoint went on the screen, and we talked through a lot of things, which were basically the very welcome end to barely meeting payroll during the months that were coming up before the dues payments came in. And we really, really and Dan Walker being cash manager treasurer. And it was a difficult time and there was an awful lot of contention around the match factory and all of that. And so I come back to you as your retreaded treasurer in an entirely different financial perspective, one that is quite a bit better. Um, so no PowerPoint and four bullet points instead. And so you're all happy. <laughs> you don't have to refill the coffee. You don't have to have your eyes roll back. So, um, we have a joint APS APRL treasurer now. Uh, in your recent past, you had separate roles. And I think that that all works a lot better for the very big reason that's really the underpinning of all of this was the decision to pay off the mortgage. I think that has really solidified our financial picture in a very positive way. Thank God, as we enter into these inflationary times, we're not seeing escalations on mortgages that are, that are due. Um, we still have a major financial concern as Scott was talking through of our operational income. However, we don't have the big mortgage on our back and we do have empty leasing space that we may well see some good news um, that really gets us around the corner. So my role here is to keep a focus on the big picture. It's a cross check to daily financial operations and a big box of vouchers goes through a signature process with Scott and I that Jeff handles very well. And all of this is terribly familiar to me when I worked with Rick Banks on it in the past. Things are really in lockstep and have performed consistently. Another role that's very important is going through the work with the auditor, which also is a recognition of the Jeff and some of the work there that we're in good shape with our audit. And um, the treasurer convenes a joint finance and audit committee and our two things is the audit, which we've just gone through and our major work really was transitioning our invested funds to a new investment manager. And that work has been done, we're transferred over, we've already had the first reporting from that new finance manager and that is all going really well. Uh, so just from an overview perspective, I think things financially are going to be challenged just as Scott was speaking of in our coming years, hopefully offset by some 
rental income. Hopefully our projections aren't as dire as we think. And hopefully offset by our generous donors that have bailed us out before, um, that, that donated funds would end up making things kind of come together in a way that works well. But in a very big picture, we can be thankful to where, where we are. It could be so much worse in the hobby and community with our demographics. Uh, our core sectors are, are under, underperforming, yes, but we also have been very good at managing our cash and not getting ridiculous about it and making the cuts that need to be made. So um, I think in short, we operate within our means, but we rely on donations for our capital expenditures and for big things that we want to do. We do them when we can do them and we operate financially prudently and we can be thankful that we don't have a big old mortgage coming us on that that is my report. Anyone have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Next is the librarian's report. And for that, we turn to Scott Tiffany. Uh, things in the library are sort of going fairly well. We, I'll talk a little bit about the progress of the digital library project. It's going very, very well. We're about to move into another phase of that. Going forward, uh, we also have two large donations, uh, one which you know of, and one which is... It may be hard for that angle, Scott, to advance it. Go over some of the, the usual data that we've uh, talked about in the past, also the collection management class. But overall, we're sort of doing very, very well on uh, projects in the library, just the day-to-day -day processing of material and sort of uh, meeting requests and things like that. And I'll go over a little bit of that and also talk a little bit about uh, some events that we're having coming up and sort of an exhibit that we're going to be having. In the Just in terms of the collection, it's growing at a fairly sort of uh, regular rate. I'm not too concerned about anything that's happening with uh, the number of items we're getting into the library or processing for the library. It's uh, sort of meeting sort of well within the rates of uh, growth that I'm, I'm comfortable with. In 2020, we're about 1.9, and now we're sort of in the, the range of about 1.5% of the collection growing well within what we have in terms of shelf space, things like that. Capacity, the only one that's sort of growing a little more uh, larger that, than uh, we anticipated originally when I started uh, was the post tax area where we have our auctions. A lot of that is due to the trencher donation, which we've talked about in the past. A lot of that material are you know, auction catalogs. So that that is growing, but I have staff as well as volunteers going through that collection, weeding out material. And when I say weeding, it's a library term. Basically, it means that if, if there are extra copies, we sort of keep, keep store them elsewhere. We don't store them on the actual shelves so that they're available for people still to use. This is something that we're really I'm sort of working towards, sort of one of the, the goals that I wanted to create. We get a lot of donations, as all of you know, into the library. Uh, some of them come un unsolicited some of them sort of we sort of people contact us first and what we're trying to do is sort of get, make people more aware that they contact us first before they sort of donate material so this is sort of a snapshot of that we've got it up to about 37 uh, percent meaning 37 percent of the material that comes to us we can actually use for the collection what was really gratifying was over volunteer work week i had a number of volunteers sort of processing material that came into life particularly books that come into the library as donations and it was about a 50-50 split. So it was great to see that, you know, 50% of the material that they were going through and processing, we actually needed for the collection. So this is working. I want to keep that number 37 uh, growing so that we get closer and closer to materials that we actually need for the collection. We try to make use of anything that comes into the library. So if we can't use it in the collection, we sort of offer it to other libraries, other philatelic libraries, or we repurpose it in some way for resale. In terms of request data, so... If you were just to see this in isolation, you would think that this is sort of a, you know, what's happening, people aren't uh, contacting the library as much. And that is happening in terms of actual requests that come to us, email or phone calls or letters and things like that. But I'm not too concerned with that because people, as I'll, say, I'll show you in a moment, people are now now doing a lot of their own, uh, re answering their own requests remotely through our digital library. Our digital library numbers are continually growing and, and moving up. So I think a lot of people are moving from what I've talked to, when I've talked to both Alicia and uh, Marsha, who do a lot of the requests that come into the library, they're finding the, the requests they're receiving are much more detailed. So they may not be things that, sort of simple things that somebody could look up themselves. So I think a lot of those people are moving towards using the digital library. And so that's why it's reflected in these numbers. So these are the numbers of requests that people are actually contacting us. Just to give you, I'm really proud of uh, where we've gotten in phase one of the project phase one started March 1st of last year. 
We've more than doubled the size of the digital library. We've just surpassed about 7,000 journal issues in the library now. Of the original 51 permissions that we had for journals to put into the, the digital library, we have 39 of those complete now. That number is a little low in terms of the pages we've added. I think we're actually closer to 900,000 pages now that are full text searchable in the database, which is fantastic. I'm hoping to get to a million fairly soon this year. So I've gone out and sort of asked for other permissions for some journals, for some books, as well as many exhibits that we have that we want to get up into the database. And I'll talk a little bit about that a little bit more when I talk about the one of the donations that we've received recently. So here's some of the use data that we, we have from the digital library. This is monthly access events. An access event is when somebody comes to the digital library to either download something, print something, save something. And this is how often we're sort of getting that use. So we had a couple of spikes early on when we were first putting the word out there about the library, but it sort of really leveled off and we're right around sort of in that sort of area now. So it's getting a lot of use. I think as we sort of expand what's in there, we focus mainly, mainly right now on journals and things like that. So we want to expand that to books, exhibits. I think we'll get more use when those other formats are put into the In terms of uh, the access events, so this gives you a snapshot of year by year, the average per month that we're getting. And you can see a steady, uh, in, a steady increase as we've gone along. In terms of users, so these are unique users, people who come to the database, we can sort of see, identify them by the ISP they, they come from. So we can tell where they're coming from, their unique user. That is steadily grown as well. So we're getting different people using the database. It's not the same. There are people using it over and over and over. Yes. Do you know how to use the digital library step by step for the uninitiated computer ignorance? Because I think that would really help. That's a great question. I have a few tutorials that are on the website, but it is something that I want to expand this year. I want to have a few more sort of live sessions, like have a, like a Snapchat or something like that involved with that. I also want to do sort of canned sort of videos. Uh, here's how you log in. Here's how you do a simple search. Here's how you do how you download something or print something. So I am working on those. And I also want to have those in sort of something in a PDF that you can download yourself and do at home. So those are things I am working. It would really, really help if you dumb it down, but do a step-by-step -step for the, the people. Many fan collectors are not very computer savvy, mm -hmm. and that would be a real help. Yeah. So that is yes, still uh, open access to the library, or is it? Closed it's still open library? access now, yes. We're sort of looking at sort of, it's always been sort of on the on our, our, our mind to sort of think about uh, maybe sort of having some sort of limited access just for members and then a pay access for people who are not members, but right now it's still open access to anyone. Yeah. Then sort of averaging per month in terms of unique users per month and how we've seen steady growth with that as well. In terms of phase two, so we want to hire a full-time digital librarian. This person will be responsible for overseeing the project, making sure that we're moving it into the next phase, which will involve, right now we've sort of focused on uh, content that's already in digital form. We want to move towards things that are, that have to be scanned. They're only in paper form only that we have to scan ourselves, as well as improving things with the interface. We have we've received feedback about people who have used the database. The way we have it right now is it's in its basic form. We want somebody to sort of fix up the way it looks, the branding of it, as well as sort of making it easier to use so that it's more intuitive, something that that person will be responsible for. And when I get back from the show, that's something that we're going to sort of look into. So, uh, putting out the announcement for a digital library so to get that started in terms of the collection management policy we'll talk about that a little later but just it's the digital librarian it's, do they have to be an actual librarian great questions doesn't have to be someone who's necessarily a librarian at least my sort of vision for it is somebody who's very conversant with the software content dm and has a great, great understanding of that we can teach them enough about sort of the librarian the, the library aspects of the database I, so that's just my initial thought, yeah. So in terms of the collection management policy, which we'll talk about a little later, so it was a policy put in, that we sort of revised and sort of to, to look at donations as they were received in the library, just to give people an idea of collection scope. In terms of, we're trying to streamline the process. So we do have a process right now when things come in that they're acknowledged and things like that, but we do want to sort of make that uh, a little easier for people who are considering donating to the library to so also sort of manage donor expectations and then our responsibilities for those donations. But we can, yes. See the short form and the long form of that come out soon. Okay. I just think you've got a couple of things that might be headed your way. And if the college is not out in front of them, yeah. from the pallets, I think like a little bit of 
push that now will save you way too much stuff like yes. Every two years, we have the Postal History Symposium between uh, our organization and the National Postal Museum. And our next one is in November of next year. I'm sorry, starting with planning with that. The theme is going to be uh, something involved with the Universal Postal Union. So if you have people who are interested in presenting papers or presenting presentations, I'd be interested in hearing from them. And the U.S. Classic Society has stepped up to be a co-sponsor of that event as well. I want to talk briefly about the airmail exhibits. So Scott uh, has contacted myself in the library, and we're just in the process now of putting together. Some of you have seen the Holocaust exhibit, which we have. It's going to be something that's in that space just beside it. We uh, have a lot of material that's come into the library, as you know, the Heinz airmail collection, things like that. We've also received some donations of parts of an airplane that was originally one of the airplanes that sort of flew airmail in the area that was donated to us by a local gentleman. And so we really want to sort of spearhead a sort of an IML exhibit. I've met briefly with a small committee so far, I'll be myself and uh, Marion Mills in the library, who will sort of be spearheading that committee. And we're sort of just now sort of putting together the group that we're going to sort of think about ideas about how we're going to do it. And sort of it's going to be about uh, not just airmail in the Belfont area or the Center County area of Pennsylvania, but we're looking at a larger picture of airmail when it first uh, was came, came into being in this country. Yes. The yeah. Holocaust and this airmail. When you put up a, an exhibit like this, do you also put in a planned expiration date for when it would come down? That's a good question. <laughs> I don't have that. No. Just, I'm making the comment just because I think yeah. that some of these things you you can look at the upfront cost. There's a cost to have it there, even if it's just cleaning and whatever. And right. then there's a cost to dismantle and what to do with all the physical with stuff. One of the things I can tell you about the Holocaust exhibit is I'm currently working with a local set of community leaders not just to maintain the long-term longevity of the Holocaust exhibit as it is, but really to create accessibility and expansion to go along with that. So there is a, because of the, all the local coverage we've gotten from that, the, there are members of the community, business leaders, community leaders, Jewish leaders, who've all come together and they're we're slowly working through a process of establishing a fund that would allow us one, to maintain the, the exhibit, but then second to that, also create greater access for it by producing educational documents that go with it online. And then third to that is to be able to expand it so that we can bring additional material in. So my expectation for the airmail exhibit would be very similar to that. A dedicated fund raised locally or through interested parties. You know, we already raised $5,000 for the airmail exhibit courtesy of our good friends at the American Airmail Society through the auspices of Aerophilately last year, I suckered, I mean, I talked Steve Reinhardt <laughs> into, into donating $5,000 to help advance the cause. And so now that I've got some of the material, I need a little bit of a vision to start talking about money to be raised to create that exhibit. And so that's what Scott's working on right now. And then from there, I'll be able to go out and work on the financing. Of that as well. so ideally, I think both of these should be permanent exhibits as long as we are, as long as we are there much like the Hedgeville Post Office, because they serve such a unique and critical community feature. For us, I think it makes us a value in Center County, and I want to keep those going so that we can do that. That's the end, but I do want to sort of add two things. I mentioned earlier about a couple of donations that we received, one that you do know about, venture donation. News, past volunteer work week, we saw the original 24 pallets of material, now down to about eight pallets of material. So... Uh, it's still a long way to go because this is this sort of material is in the process. We figured out what we want to do with it. Either it's going into the collection, as I mentioned earlier, with auction catalogs, or we have to sort of, we're setting aside some of the philatelic material. That's something that Scott and I will still have discussions about what we're doing with that, but it's it's coming along. It took a while. We received that back in uh, March of 2021, So, but it is coming along, and we've made, we've made good progress over this recent volunteer work week. The other one I want to mention is the Al Kugel uh, material that we received back in February of this year. Ken Martin and I went to his home uh, after he passed in uh, Hinsdale, Illinois, and we, we, we went through some of his uh, philatelic material as well as his library. He had this extensive library. Uh, we had a lot of that material. We've had uh, someone come in and sort of done a, a quick appraisal of it and an inventory of it. I, I would just say that uh, one of the things that we are working on, I'm working with the Military Postal History Society in terms of digitizing his exhibits. So they've started that process and they've reached out to us to sort of finish it for them. So we have a lot of the exhibits in at house, in house at uh, the APRL, and we're going to sort of work with them to sort of finish that project. Yeah. Where is that taking place? Oh, sorry. That, and sorry, in Belfast. In Belfast. Maybe in Belfast. Any questions? Yes. Scott, could you explain a little bit more about how 
exhibits will be digitized. Bob, what's going <coughs> work there? How so we're working. We're working with the, as I say, the military postal museum. They've done. Uh, if you go to their website, there's a part of their website called Al's Room that uh, has some of the ones one they've done. What we're going to do is sort of go through what we have, compare it with what they've done already, and sort of digitize and sort of scan them, scan the original sort of um, exhibits and save them. And uh, potentially we'll, act, we'll be giving a copy to them of those exhibits as well as it'll be in the digital library and have them there. So, and, and apart from Al Poole's exhibits, I mean, are other exhibits? Yes, we, I have uh, so many exhibits that we need to get up there. I have about, I have commissions right now for about 240 exhibits. That I've received. But all these all need to be scanned, right? Um, about half of those have already scanned. All, all so, right, scanned. Um, yeah, the, the, for whatever reason, in the software we use in Content DM, exhibits take a little longer to upload because of the, the, the number of images. Uh, the images take longer to sort of upload in the database. But no, we do have a bit of both. In the of the Are these being scanned? Is your intention to scan them at a higher resolution? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So, so, I, so at, as give me some numbers up just on what the um well the dpi or something we can do 600 but we'd like to do up to 1200 depending on uh, the, the images on the paper and things like that so we're looking to sort of scan them at that uh, high, much higher rate so that people can as opposed to journals which are at journals we start at minimum 300 because it's, if it's just tech but if it has images on the page we like to do everything at 600. yes can you give us an update on um Picking out grants. Uh, we are looking for some some grants related to the digital library project, but it's not something that I've done a lot of sort of work on, to be honest. But it is something in terms of uh, projects going forward that uh, Scott and I have sort of discussed uh, briefly. I don't have a sort of a, an actual update for that. But yes. Uh, how? Where in the queue is the PLR being completed? The PLRs are just about done. Uh, They're just about done. Yeah. We've recently sort of had it added a whole bunch uh, about several months ago. Several months ago. Oh, we should be able to get access. Yeah, they're, they're, they're now. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Scott. And now for the main event, the director report is Scott English. Morning, everyone. Good morning. I am Scott English, your executive director. <laughs> Hold for polls. So I'll start with this so that this is something we can get out of the way. Uh, my contract was to end on December the 31st in St. Louis. One of the things that we talked about and subsequently agreed to is to extend that just a little bit longer. My expectation, Foster, write this down, was to depart the APS and move on to something different. Through the hard work of Cheryl Gons, some gentle arm twisting and some artful persuasion, uh, the board has generously offered me an extension for three years that would get us through December 31st, 2026, and I am saying yes. I will be almost old enough to be an APS member by the end of 2026. <laughs> My goal is to, over the next three years, bring some transformation to the organization that it, I think it desperately needs, and that's what I want to talk about today. I characterize my time at the APS in two phases. Number one is you hired me to do a job. Get rid of the deficit, fix some things, and move on. Bob Ziegler, our esteemed past president, gently convinced me in 2021 that I needed to stick around and see the pandemic through. It was an enjoyable conversation, and I said yes because I wanted, I thought we were in a very fragile state. Emerging from the pandemic, the picture has cleared a little bit, and that's what I want to talk about today and where I think I'm going to take things over the next three years. All right, so let's start with membership recruitment. One, the numbers that I'm going to show you are through the end of July of 2023. Now, I have both comparables and totals for the year, uh, plus our projection for 2023. As you can see, prior to the pandemic, our recruitment took a hit. Do you all know how much you pay for dues on an annual basis? For those of you who aren't life members, uh, how much you have to pay annually to be a member of the APS? $45. Do you know how long that's been true? Since 2008. George W. Bush was president of the United States when we instituted a $45 fee. Do you know what that $45 annual dues is worth today? $31. We are now charging less money adjusted for inflation than we were in 2003 when we raised the dues from $25 to $35. And I think that's helped 
The pandemic has also helped. As you can see, in 2021, we had one of our best years in recruiting since 2008. When we raised our dues to $45 in 2008, we devastated the ATS. We devastated them for two reasons. Number one, political. They thought the batch factory was the reason why they were paying almost twice as much money in five years than they've been paying in 2002. Fair for them to say. The second thing is, is that we hit a working class group of people at the same time that the Great Recession was rolling in. Job insecurity suddenly made the hobby seem frivolous to them. Now, I can tell you one thing about recruitment. If you have someone and they disappear, it is much harder to convince them to come back than if you never had them to begin with. I have a long list of former girlfriends that would agree with that. <laughs> Except for one. But uh, as you can see this year, now we started off the year slow. If I showed you through June of this year, you would be concerned. In July, we added 177 new applications, which is a staggering number. The good news is that relative to last year, the third quarter of 2022 was weak, which means that we can make up ground in, 2000, in 2023 and get us back on track to get towards that 1580 to 1600 zone, which is typically what we shoot for. Now, our membership is just below 25,000 this year. We're about 1,000 off from last year. Why? Again, soft recruiting in the first six months of the year that will pick up as time moves on. So that number will shrink as we get later in the year, assuming we have an equally as good in August as we did in July, and Jeff and Scott can attest to this. We got everyone's attention uh, back in May to start talking about doing some things different. And so this is one of the things that we've seen a positive net gain on, and I expect this to continue. So the, the membership fee, how much does it cost? You pay 45 bucks, you get 45 bucks back, some do, some don't. I, it really depends on what you what you qualify. I mean, we have underutilization in almost every department except for the magazine, the website, and the news. There you have a majority of the members using the, the service, and so they're underwriting those operations, and I think in an inappropriate way. Most members, you know, almost 98% of our members use the magazine in one way, shape, or form or another. 80% of them read the magazine on a monthly basis based on our surveys. When you start talking about advertising, circuit sales, internet sales, things like that, you have far fewer people participating. Under a third of our members participate in this. That's why we drive the cost of those to be slightly more. So even if you're using a service like circuit sales, if you're using a service like internet sales, except for the library itself, because that's part of our underlying mission as an organization, and education, you don't have to pay nearly as much money, but you do pay more money for the services. And that's been decided, that's been one of the determined changes that I've made over the last eight years was to help drive it towards those users rather than asking the membership in general to underwrite the operations. But, you know, we are losing members on an annual basis and that's a reason to be concerned. So let's talk about membership for a second. As I said, we're at 24,861. That's 1,030 off from this time last year. Again, going back to the reason we had a soft first half of the year in terms of recruitment, we're going to pick up the slack on that in the second half of the year. That number will drop. Uh, realistically speaking, folks, I've said this time and again, we peaked in our membership in 1988. The only other great thing that happened that year is I graduated from high school. And we have been on a decline ever since. The last year that we had a positive gain in membership was 1992. That was World Columbian. That is correct. I would think that would be a huge contributor to that. So one of the things that we've reinstituted this year that uh, had dropped by the wayside was increased prospecting from club memberships to replace our, you know, uh, former annual free membership offer from one member to another. And Alex Hyman used to pay for everyone to join the APS, a certain list of people. And so we pick up probably about 150 from that. He didn't do it this year because he's been preoccupied. And so we focused on other ways of increasing our prospecting, being more aggressive, which is something we should do anyway. A gold star recruiting plan. So this is what really contributed to it. One of the other things that we did this year is that we targeted some big recruiters, Don Sunman, Alex, Matt Leapson, a few others, and basically gave them a unique opportunity to push out to their, their clients, to other folks, an opportunity to join the APS. And that has helped generate. We're running that through August uh, so that we can keep, keep picking those up but we see that as being an incredibly positive gain towards our new applications. And at the end of it, we will recognize them for their efforts 
and how many people they've picked up as a result of that. Onboarding for first year members. This is something we've talked about a lot and we are actually at the point of execution. The first thing that we wanna do is do welcome emails for people who join. My frustration has been over the last few years that people don't hear from us again until we're asking them to renew or do something else like give money rather than simply just saying, hey, by the way, we're here to help guide you through the first year of your membership in the APS and help you understand the benefits a little bit better. One of the things that we hear from non-users of the services that we provide, particularly expertising circuit sales and internet sales, is we don't do nearly enough for the people who don't use it. They don't hear nearly enough information to understand why they should. Makes sense, right? Common sense. But you want to ask and make sure that you are they are actually not getting enough information. And that's one of the things that happens. Habitually, internally, one of the things I combat is, well, we've said it once. And as I often tell people in politics, you know, we used to say things three times over. So you tell them, then you tell them again, and then you tell them one last time just to make sure they heard you. And that's what we've got to do with all of our services. We've got to trumpet them on an annual basis. If we go back and look at that recruitment and we talk about how many people have been recruited in, say, just the last eight years, we have 11,000 new members that belong to the APS. So nearly half of our members have joined in the last eight years. If we haven't talked to them already about our services, then how are we seriously expecting them to understand them? More importantly, if they're becoming more advanced they may not know why they need circuit sales. They may not know why they need expertising, but we've got to engage them at a time when it's appropriate for them to have that aha moment and why they should be utilizing the services. So uh, the current uh, uh, usage rate, this is a crazy question. Would we, would, would we be better off with 50,000 members, let's say at 24, $25 a head, or with 25,000 uh, members at 45 I am going to figure that out next year, here, and I'll get to that in a moment, because you're asking exactly the right question, and that is, is you know, is price, how important is price point in terms of the people who can join the APS, and what are you going to give them for that price point? So I'll get to that a little bit later in this discussion, but you're asking exactly the right question, and that's one that we've got to answer for you by the time October comes. Exit surveys to see why people will lapse their membership. So one of the things that we know for a fact is there are two, there are two contributing reasons for why 70% of our members. One is they've been called home. That's the most significant reason why people leave the APS. If I could stop that, boy, howdy, I would be doing something. I really, really keep trying, folks. I promise you this every year. I look into it every way I can stop people from dying. For those of you who are MDs around the table, if you've got some advice, let me know. But that's the number one reason. The second is change in life condition, right? Our members are aging out. They lose their eyesight. They lose their interest in collecting because they're 92 years old. And so they turn to converting. Although we did have someone join that was 107 two months ago. But that's the optimism I've got to tap into though, right? <laughs> so what for those who are left, the two answers to the question are price point and return on investment. So I know those are the problems and I've got to be able to engage them in a different way and say, hey, by the way, I know you left the APS because you were one, either paying too much money. And one of the surveys, when I did a survey late last year, one of the questions I asked for people who used to be members or who aren't currently members is would they entertain the idea of a digital only membership for $35? Overwhelmingly for the non-members and the former members, the answer was yes. I also asked APS members, where would they come down on this? And 24% of them said they would convert their membership. Now, I think that number is actually higher than that because most of, we have many members who hate paying for parking, let alone anything else. So if I throw something cheaper at them, they may take us up on it. One of the things that I, I, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but one of the reasons why that $45 membership exists as a digital was because of the abuse of the system. And that's the thing that I've got to put a check on. All right, so the tiered membership, digital only $35, it's currently $45. The reason is, because many times people would take the digital membership and then go, I actually want to get the magazine. And so they would come back with the expectation that we would upgrade them, give them all of the back issues they missed, and you know, catch them up. But the point is, is that we've got to put some protections in place to make sure that if someone upgrades, one, they pay for it, and two, that they have a reasonable expectation of what they should actually get. If I've got to send you six, six months of magazines, and you're only going to give me $10 more, I'm going to lose money on that proposition. So you're not doing me any favors by becoming a male only. 24% of APS members would take the digital, 65% of non-members total would take the option. So that means I've got an entire group of people out there at $35, I specifically asked. So I've got an audience at $35 that would be very much interested. And I'm going to go test the marketplace. And that goes back to asking the question of, so what else would they do for $35? And that's what we've got to start working on. 
The American Numismatic Association, this is very interesting, on an annual basis, now they have 26,000 members total, but that counts clubs, like members, all sorts of other things. For people who belong to the ANA on an annual basis, and I am one of them, Eric is another. Did you pay your dues? Yeah. Did you pay them before they raise them? Yeah. They're raising their dues to $59 a year if you are a member of the ANA and you get the magazine shipped to you. $59 a year. Now, this is the second time they've done it. The good news is that they offer a digital membership. Here's what's that. Of the 18,000 members that they renew on an annual basis, 10,000 take the magazine option. 8,000 take the digital only option. This is how they've managed to maintain their membership in a way differently than the way that we do. And I think that's worth noting because we are moving into a digital age where people are okay with not getting the magazine. I just had a conversation with a dealer last night who said, hey, do you take the old APs? Because I've got a whole bunch of them. I've been a member for almost 50 years and I'll, I'd like to donate them to you. And I said, no, thanks. Because I don't need the magazines back. And I think when people begin the APS, they think a lot of different things. We know that there are a lot of people out there who digitally download the magazines and that's okay. You know, But my idea is we want to get, rid of, get away from it. Why? One of the number one drivers and costs in editorial today is not personnel. It is postage and production. Production has jumped significantly, and I'll show that when we go through that discussion. Production of the magazine has gone up substantially. If I can convince more people to become digital-only members, I can keep the operation going because I have a great staff, but then I don't have to spend nearly as much money getting that magazine from point A to point B. So implementation. We'll do this by the due season. We already have this option. This does not require a whole lot of work other than education, promotion. And the two things that I'm going to promote is good news. This year, you're going to pay $31 to be an APS member if you've been a member since 2008. That's funny, but I still like it. The second thing is, is I'm actually going to cut dues. The single biggest user of our digital membership today are our friends overseas. Because the cost of being a member internationally is $65. In Canada, it's $55. And the conversion rate kills our poor Canadian friends. And I want more of them to be members of the APS. Gina's smiling. Hopefully I can get her to join at $35 instead of $45 next year. Or do you take the magazine option? We're charging this woman an arm and a leg. <laughs> so my goal is to one, also not only do I want to encourage more U.S. collectors to be a member of the APS, I want to encourage more international members to be members of the APS. And I'm going to do it by cutting the dues and the charges that we put on them. And my goal was to ultimately grow our audience, both U.S. and abroad. What's my objective? In the first year, I want this to retain at least 5% of members that we would otherwise not retain. I have a historical average number that I know that I, I'm going to hit. What's really interesting about that is when we talk about factoring in the cost impact of our membership loss, it's always factored as 50% of revenue. Why? 50% of our members on an annual basis die and are life members. And so we know that that impact is going to stop sooner or later because we've gone from about 6,000 members eight years ago to about 3,500 members today. That's how many life members we've gained and lost, and that's, the, the, that's how it's balanced. Now, some of them pay. Poor, poor guys like me pay for a life membership, and I didn't get the great deal. A lot of people did back in the 80s. I had to pay $1,300 for it. People still do that, but it's really hard for us to encourage young people to join if you're going to pay $1,300 to be a life member. So I want to try to find ways to encourage them to join now and then ultimately want to be a life member. The other is that I want to increase recruitment by 10%, which means that we should next year have at least 1,700 new, new applications come through our door because I'm going, to I'm going to market this digital membership and I expect that to increase the amount of people that we have. So that's a, a, an actual measurable number. How about the discount dual membership or A and A and APS? Has that ever... Being consumed or discussed. Yeah, well, personally, I'd love it because it would save me some money, but it, it has been discussed. They're going through a leadership change, they're going through a dues change, so that's not something that they have at the top of their list. We're going to do a joint issue with the ANA this year. So in November, we're doing a joint APS ANA issue of the magazine. So we'll be able to see what they publish in their journal, and our members, you know, their members will be able to see what we do in ours. So we're seeing these crossover promotions. I'm also talking about 2027, doing another joint show, location show with them like we did in Chicago in 2021. So I do see more and more partnerships coming from the ANA. We, as a group of collectibles, we've got to sit together. And so we've got to keep pushing on them. All right, so revenue versus expenses. Here is 
Here are the revenues versus expenses over the last five years, including the one projected for this year. Now, as you can see, our revenues are sort of back to pre-COVID conditions. Not quite, but they're close. Expenses are uh, also much higher though than they have been in years past. Again, going back to what are the drivers, personnel is slightly higher than it's been over the past, uh, as well uh, as, and that's to be expected, to be honest with you, if you have a workforce that sticks around, you're going to pay more money for them. It just happens that way. The other expense drivers are postage and the cost of production of the magazine. Those things are just not, they keep moving up at a rate much faster than everything else that we do. So as you can see, we're running about an $18,000 deficit. Three months ago, we were running about a $32,000 deficit. And so we work to take aggressive stance, one, to uh, manage expenses so that we can do much better with them. Second is that we're going to have to work on the revenue side of the equation, which is where we are right now. And rightfully so, you should expect me to want to do that. So... One of the big hits we've taken is we're about 22,000 behind uh, membership uh, dues. I mentioned this before. We had a weak first half, and so that has an impact on our budget of about $22,000. Again, if we are if we're do what we're supposed to do in the second half of the year, what we're working on doing for the second half of the year, that deficit will go away. By the end of the year, we may not hit it exactly, but we'll be as close as humanly possible to. Um, and that is my objective, and that is something that we're working very hard on. And that's an all hands on the deck effort. That's not just one person in my organization that's doing that, it's all of us. Personnel, as you can see, personnel expenses are higher, although they're slightly lower than what we budgeted for this year. So we're at about 24,000. What's that mean? That means this is one of the ways that I have solved that, you know, the deficit problem. We have a hiring freeze on and we're managing the part-time employees so that we're not overspending where we don't need to. Does it have an impact? A little bit but I'm not terribly concerned just yet that it's gonna harm our operations. The more important thing is what a deficit would do to us from the operational standpoint. I'm not in favor of that. I don't wanna run a deficit any year. And I've always made a commitment to run a balanced budget on the operational side of things, forget all of the other factors. Display ads, revenue is better, but not where we want it to be. The good news is, is that I think we can catch up. July, this is through June of this year, July was, eh, August was better. So we will see these numbers improve. I think realistically we'll hit 400,000, not necessarily 410, but I think we'll hit 400,000 by the end of the year. And that means that'll be one of the better years we've had since 2019. So we are on target for that. We're doing very well with it. And our cost of acquisition of ads is lower than it's ever been. And that was all part of the agreement we were reached last year with our friends at Fox. And I'm very happy with the results we're getting as from them. So things are moving in the right direction. Production to distribution. As you can see, even though it's not as high as we had budgeted already, we have budgeted $490,000 for this year for production and distribution of the magazine, which far exceeds any year that we've had prior to that. One of the things that typically guards us against higher costs in production and distribution is our membership loss. I hate to say that, but the more, you know, when we lose members, it costs us less money to get the magazine out on the streets. You can see over the last few years, though, that that offset has been killed by the cost of paper, the cost of labor and putting that together, and the cost of posters and getting it out, to the, out the door. The USPS is our enemy right now in a number of ways. This is one of them. They are raising their costs much faster than we can keep up with them. The cost of production of the magazine itself is outpacing. Inflationary pressures are out there everywhere. And yet we still only charge $45 a year. And even though we're running a deficit right now, we don't and we won't by the end of this year. But nobody is helping us do this. I can tell you that now. That's my frustration. No one is helping us do this. Much as I would appreciate it. All right, let's talk about certain sales for a minute. This is a business operation within our nonprofit. And we rely on this income. And the reason why I use contribution reserves is because for lack of a better term in a nonprofit world, this is profit. Now, how do we do? Well, in 2018, we made about 33 grand. 2000, we made about 35,000. 2020, we actually lost money. At the end of the year, because we took such a hit on the pandemic, we lost money in the operation. 
Now, this is all in expenses, all costs associated with it. We bounced back in 2021 and we did slightly better. The better we do in this business operation, the more we can underwrite operations everywhere else in the building. What's my concern? Well, we're way behind right now. And this is a trend line, by the way, with circuit sales. It worries me. It worries me because our inventory has dropped about two and a half million dollars over the last six years in terms of actual material that we've got in there. We were over six million dollars and we're now barely over four. So it's gone up. We were, you know, we were at six and a half million dollars. We're now barely over four. And I'm concerned we're going to drop below four million soon. Second is cost of postage is starting to harm our business in here. Right? Everyone loves that we put donated postage on packages. Here's the problem with that. It costs something. So we're shipping packages now through a discount shipper because we can do that. It's legal. We pay less money. We charge less money and the packages get there. But they don't have all the stamps on them anymore. And that hurts people's feelings. And I understand that. But we have to operate in the business sense, not in a I feel good about the package I got sense. Because that does not pay the bills. If it did, if our staff would just take that goodwill instead of a paycheck, we'd be in great shape. <laughs> but everything comes with a cost. And so we're doing the things that we can in order to run this business. What I'm worried about, though, is we are going to fall far short of the $130,000 we were banking on this year to underwrite all of our nonprofit activities. That is a problem. And this problem is not a one-year problem. This is a problem. And so I don't know yet. I'm not ready to tell you that circuit sales is dead yet. You know, we've all been waiting for this, right? There's always that late 1950s actor that passes away at 103 and we go, wait, is that guy still alive? Circuit sales are going to go the same way. Question. So I understand uh, the total value of what we have in stock to sell has changed. Has the number of sellers dropped? Has the number of buyers dropped? Are they moving instead to hip stamps? Um, you see why all that is happening? There are two reasons for it. Number one is cost of postage and the amount of time that it takes. We just did a survey about circuit sales. Why were you a seller and why aren't you a seller now? And how are you selling and buying your stamps now? And all survey indications tell us two things. One is the reason why people don't either buy or sell on the program anymore is time and postage. The cost of both are too prohibitive for them relative to other ways to get rid of their stamps, particularly online. And so people are disposing of their stamps now or they're buying their stamps online. There's a little bit of an instant gratification feeling there. It's also cheap. The overhead cost of doing it is also cheaper. And they're, they find more material that they are looking for. Quality of the material that we get in circuit sales is not what I'd like it to be. It's not what anybody wants it to be. I think people think that we somehow control that. It is what people are willing to sell, not what we're willing to take and put in there. Now, we can do some things, and that's what I want to talk about, that can improve how we operate. So what are our challenges? Spatial. 50% of APS members have never used circuit books. This is the one of the oldest programs we offer. Following the creation of the American Philatelic Society was the exchange program, which is circuit sales. But 53% have never touched a book in any way, shape, or form. That's a problem. Time and postage are two of the biggest obstacles we have. Yes, Melanie. Clubs. And I know you are a diehard advocate for circuit sales, so I'm glad you're asking this question. Clubs that receive circuit sales. That's all part of this, but where we where we run into issues with the clubs is if it, you know it's entirely up to a, it's sort of hit or miss. So we send them out. We hope they sell. Probably about a quarter of our clubs are what I would consider to be we make money back on the commissions to justify the expense of sending them out. And then for 75%, we'll call it a subsidized club benefit. Yes, some clubs don't participate at all. Well, but then they don't cost me anything either. But if I'm sending circuits out to a club and say I send 20 circuit books out, that has a cost associated with it. Say we send it there and then we end up selling $15 worth of material, then we haven't really justified the expense of sending it out there. We tried to skin this cat a couple of different ways. We just sort of accepted that we're going to lose money with certain clubs. For now, that's what we're willing to do. 
but it does take a hit to the rest of the operation as a result of that. It's not su substantial, and that's why I don't worry about it. And I think clubs need to have reasons for people to convene there. And this is one way for many clubs to rely on drawing members in, is being able to get access to the circuit. But I mean, look, let's be honest. If you look at our overall membership, 60%, I just did a survey, 60% of respondents who belong to the APS don't belong to a local club. I'm in the outlier group that belongs to multiple local clubs since I belong to almost 90 at this point. All over, well, actually all over the world if you count them. So time and postage are the two biggest issues. It takes a lot more time to go through a circuit book and not necessarily for any return on the time. And postage is just continues to grow up, just go up. Opportunities. One, I'm talking about shortening the book cycle from 18 months to 12 months. For those of you who are familiar with the program, if you submit a circuit book, it's going to go on the circuit multiple times over an 18 month period. I think this is a bit of a disincentive for people who sell stamps. Tragically, probably about 20% of the stamps that I have in circulation today are owned by someone, by an estate, not by an individual, because we pay, you know, we pay out when we close out the books and the member who submitted all of these books or had all of these books prepared to go passed away. And so we're paying a loved one and a relative to circulate the books. So I want to be able to shorten it to 12 months. One, because it's when you retire that book that you settle up. And that's a good motivation for people to come back and be sellers again. I want to get more material submitted. So I think shortening the window of time, it's still not the immediate payoff of, say, doing internet sales, but it's still a better pay cycle than now. But it's funny that, like, the user is probably the elderly individual who doesn't have uh, internet access. Not necessarily. You know, Circuit Books is a great way to start a new collection. Say you decide you've done with Cuba. Should say that out loud and make it in trouble for that. But <laughs> say you decide to start collecting France Collins, one of the great ways of getting started in that is using the circuit books because you can find a lot of material, low in value, uh, and you can start investing in it. So I've I've seen very serious collectors who use it. And then you know, there are certain circuits that do very well just because there's good material there. Germany always does very well. It's incredibly popular collecting. Used modern US, but not mint modern US does well. And Duncan is a big mint modern postage seller but she gets frustrated because nobody wants to buy her stamps and i suggest it's either a price point or that people just aren't interested in modern mint us which is true but used for whatever reason us phenomenal that's fantastic and so it's just very interesting what people are interested in using on the market in the circuit book second is although many people don't do the 30 dollars, i think one of the quality issues we run into is that we've maintained this $30 book value for almost 18 years. And so the value of a $30 set of books today versus a value of a $30 set of books 18 years ago is different. And so you, one of the ways you can encourage better sales is by making sure you've got some better material in there. So raising the minimum value of the book, not excessively, probably $50 might be a way of doing that. And so that's one of the things that we've got to evaluate and look at. Obsessed about the idea that we do not trumpet our services well. If I ask any director to stand up and explain their services, I get a mixed bag. Scott Tiffany does a wonderful job of explaining the library, the benefits, and why you should be an APS member because of the APRL. It's moving, it's touching, and it's very educational. But that is, that is not always the way that our folks are thinking. They think more as operators and less as marketers. And so that's the thing we've been focused on a lot this year is talking about marketing. And so I've got to do marketing on circuit sales, buying and selling, because it is complex. It's convoluted. And because 53% of our members have never touched a book, it's arcane. And so we've got to get people to understand that better. And that really needs to be the way that we think about everything that we do at the APS. Because if you can't explain it in 30 seconds or less, we shouldn't do it. Because that's all the amount of time you have to be able to explain to somebody why they should do something. And if I can't give you a reason to belong to the APS because of the circuit sales program, maybe we shouldn't do it anymore. Because it is, it is certainly a resource that we use and allocate within the organization. And I'm not entirely sure that the profit, for lack of a better term, pays for what we end up doing for that or on behalf of that organization. The amount of postage that we manage, the mailroom op operations that we do, the accounting work that goes into it. Where's Amy? Amy does the closing on the books. How fun is that? 
So we get the we get the report sheets in. That's Amy's responsibility to make sure one that they've actually accounted for everything, and two that they've legitimately paid for everything. How many canceled credit cards have we had to go through? Oh. It's a drama every time. So you can see my point, which is there's a lot more to this than just, hey, we get a couple of bucks back for the rest of the organization. We have to put a lot of work into making that happen. And that's something that we've got to think about. Yes, Kathy. We've also looked at the people that do use it and how readily they change what category they subscribe to. Yes, I have a survey. I'm about to put the final findings out from the survey. We had about 2,200 respondents to that, which I think is statistically valid. And so I'm I'm ready to put that report out. It's just been one of those things that I have not had time to do sure. the analysis work and put it together. Well, I'm one of those people. I was doing this for a long time. I loved it. And what I loved was doing something that wasn't my collective. Yeah. You know, just it was just great. I mean, people put on and like five percent of Scott's and I'm like cut in came to good health triangle. And when I was a kid, I would have killed to have that stamp, but there it is sitting in a circuit book for ten dollars. I'll buy that. It's it. The cheaper, <laughs> there's a lot of good you know, categories was the best. I went in for something I collected and was underwhelmed, but then I went in for the things I didn't collect. I couldn't believe it. Plastic canisters, unbelievably great stuff. You know, just flipping it around. And I was just doing that because that was the first time I was treasurer and I was just trying to use every service we had just to have a sense of it. But man, it was interesting. But the, it was changing the category. So I was wondering if you're having a hard time getting new members to try it, can you get your existing members to try it more and differently? Sometimes. But some kind of a teaser, you know, like free postage when you change categories. There's some something or other that you think of. That's a great suggestion. And that, that's what we're trying to figure through now. Yeah. Maybe you could try having somebody write a little column, quarterly, whatever, of. Uh, Steals I have made for yes, some yes. because <laughs> Bob, I mean, people play the stuff out there, and I can tell you probably 10 15 times that I've found something for 15 cents that's a hundred dollars. Yeah. And it's, you know, that kind of thing happens in certain books where you can have the time to sit there, analyze it, and find out that. Once in a while, I mean, many times it's miscataloged the other way, far more often. But once in a while, you're going to find something that's a real uh, tough item that's that a, you never thought you'd own. That's an interesting idea. I like that. Clearance books. So just for everybody to, to know, when you put a book on the circuit, after you retire it, you can then turn it into what's called a clearance book, which means it's an all or nothing proposition. You lower the prices on the stamps. Say the final book value when you retire it is about 50 bucks. And you go, you know what? I'll take 20 to 20 bucks for everything in the book. And so they keep it on the circuit, get circulated again. And then when that book comes to your house, you can either say, yes, I'm going to buy all of this because you're a savvy consumer like Bob and you found something there that's incredibly undervalued. And you go, I can get $20 for that one thing. And then everything else is just gravy on top of it. So that's that's another 18 month cycle. And if you sell the clearance book, then in total, then it's done. We have donated books that come after that, which we are pure profit. So we sell those books as well. Anyway, not to belabor the circuit sale point, but the, yeah, one <laughs> other thing I think would probably help is you can educate sellers to eliminate the bottom 10% of the trash that they mount the circuit books. <laughs> which is just mind boggling and serves no purpose. And that's the that's the thing. Circuit sales still scratch that classic case that collectors have, right? And you can go to any show you want. You can go to any opportunity you want. I have fun with this because when we do summer seminar and things like that, we literally throw a pile of stamps on a table and just say, have at it. And people who've collected five minutes to 50 years sit down at that table and they dig through it with the same level of enthusiasm. Yeah. This childlike giddiness that still makes me laugh when I'm looking at a 70-year-old doing it. But it is very much true to the nature of the collector. The hunt is the fun. And finding things is part of it. And you just never know where you're going to find them. Circuit books are the same way. It still scratches that classic itch. No matter how digital the world gets, collectors ultimately want to take some time out of their day to dig through books. We've just got to figure out a way to keep it modernized, make sure that it's worth their while, and keep them moving on that process. So, what's the worst time that 
gas, for example, at the APS booth, but you had a display that showed what one of these cells even is. That people may not even know. Grand Rapids, 2015. One of the hardest things we had was paying for the shipping out. I wanted, I suggested to Carol this year that we do it, but because we're doing so many different things with hip stamp this year, she didn't want to do the sales books, but I do think for Hartford next year, it's certainly something we can do and should do um, where we get people to sit through it. I almost think that we maybe should take a sample one to some of the shows that we do, like when Scott's traveling or somebody else is traveling, like Ken Martin, who could explain a circuit book in his sleep. You know, we could sit there and show them sort of how it works and engage them a little bit on how that service works. I think having a physical copy of it's not. But I, thanks to the survey, I'm starting to see the picture of that a little bit clearer than I did. Before. And so that's the thing. Those are the things we're working on. Internet sales. The world's not coming to an end yet, folks. Although I imagine we've all heard that at one way or another since we've moved to Hipstamp. Now, why did I move to Hipstamp? Let's re review these real quick. Number one, the stability of the current site that we had in Stamp Store was not there. We were down for a total of four weeks in 2022. And that hurts our ability to get people to sell on our site. Number two, the cost of replacement of that system was cost prohibitive. The estimate started at 500 grand. Realistically, it was about $800,000 to replace it. We don't have a new website yet. Why in the world would I pay for this? Because the cost, the return on the investment would take at least a decade or more. And in technology terms, that's an entire century. It's completely unrealistic to invest that kind of money in this. And so we are either going to be in the stamp selling business online or we're not. And if we're going to be in it, it's got to be profitable, which means I've got to charge people more money for commissions, which means we've got to change the exact way that we do things so that it becomes a profit-making operation. Right now, this is a service to APS members to sell online. I think people need to understand the defined purpose for this program. It's not so that people who belong to this exclusive organization can go to a website and spend literally weeks deliberating whether or not they want to buy a single stamp, which is what happened under Stamp Store. We are in the business of selling stamps for members who cannot or will not sell stamps on their own. That is our first order of business. So all of the other complaints that you've heard, and I know that you've heard them because I've heard them too, aren't irrelevant, but that's why they think it's important, not why our members who use the service think it's important. So that's the thing we've got to be very careful about. How are we doing? About right. So we're about $30,000 ahead in revenue this year. We're about $24,000 ahead in expenses. Why? Postage. Here's a funny thing. When you take this off of Stamp Store, where you're competing with 1,999 other people buying and selling stamps, and put it in a world where 100,000 people were selling stamps and buying stamps, guess what happens? Sense of urgency. I see this stamp. I want this stamp. I buy this stamp. That did not happen in Stamp Store, which means that we get a, a greater number of orders, but a smaller value. It used to be we would send $100, $200 shipments out multiples a day. Now I'm sending $10, $15, $20 stamps out, but at 100 times more. Because people are afraid that stamp's going to disappear. Again, we've got it. we were not focused on the seller nearly as much as we should have been. Now, does that mean we do everything perfectly? No. It means we need to improve some things, but it means we need to start with the seller in mind. So we did our transition on 12-20-2022. It hasn't even been a year yet. feels like it's been 19. We've instituted a educational campaign to using the site that's ongoing. We hosted an AMA with Anna Taylor and, and Carol Hoffman. We have done some educational videos on ways to get set up. We need to do some more educational videos to make sure that people understand how to use the service and constantly engage them and remind them of doing things on it. Submissions are on par with 2022. So we're basically doing as well as we expect when it comes to submissions. We're about 16 days behind schedule right now in terms of posting those targets within 10. So we're a little bit ahead or we're a little bit behind in getting those posted. We're working to get that done as diligently as possible and as quickly as possible. We've been here before. We'll be here again. Higher number of orders, lower amount per order. This is a substantial change in our model. This means we're, but we're reaching audiences all over the world. The number of international orders that we get versus today versus the number that we've got before that is decidedly different. About half of our buyers today are international buyers. Now, I love that. The more the APS can be present in the minds of stamp collectors outside of the continental United States, the better off we're always going to be. And so this is a marketing tool. Second most important reason for us to have this project. 
is it's got a market. The APS has got to be out there and relevant. And what is the net difference? So say volume, let's say amount. Will you are you selling more money now with the lower uh, individual orders than you did before? With no, and I want to get to that because I think I've identified an issue that we need to talk about. So, huh. yes, ma'am. Um, don't we, don't we charge postage on these things? We do. Okay, so that, so that shouldn't be an expense to us. The labor. It's the labor, but I mean, the, but the, well, let me get to that. But I will tell you this. So let's talk about one of the things that you voted to change last year. One of the things that was happening in internet sales is that we were subsidizing the postage. Actually, in 2022, we subsidized our postage to the tune of about $40,000, right? So what we wanted to do was create a dollar for dollar charge. And so that was a that's something that we instituted a, you know through the budget of last year and something that we put in place this year. So the good news is, is that we're not losing money on postage. The problem is, is that we were charging too high of a flat rate. And that's something that we've addressed. So let's start with the improvements. Okay, first was requesting an APEX cert. This is something you could do on our traditional stamp store, but something we didn't necessarily have launched when we launched the site, but you can do it now. So we get requests for APEX certificates for people who buy a stamp and want to be able to get it verified, they can do it immediately before we send it out. We just send it over to Ken instead of sending it out and then making it sub submit it again. So by doing that, we save a little bit of money. So we charge a little bit less money when you purchase an a Apex cert through hip stamp. I would encourage anybody who buys a stamp over a couple hundred dollars to think seriously about getting an Apex cert. And one of the things I can tell you about Apex that I makes it, think makes us superior to a lot of others is, number one, we just don't tell you what the stock number is. We used to charge ten dollars to do that, but we actually give you more information than that. The second thing is, is that we guarantee our certificates, which nobody else on the planet, and we're dead serious about. And more often than not, more than one expert is going to look at this. So the last thing I guarantee is, I'm not going to give you your opinion, and I'm not going to give you your dealer's opinion. I'm going to give you a legitimate expert opinion, and those things matter. Tom is a expert for us. Tom has frustrated more than enough customers for us, but we our job is to tell them the truth first, not what they want to hear. And I stand by that. And I think Tom does a phenomenal. Actually, Tom's one of our better ones. He'll never admit to this, but he's better because he'll actually tell you if it's not, if it's not what it says, what they thought it was. He'll actually tell you why and how to figure it out next time on your own. Tell my business, but you know. <laughs> so if it's done, if it's a if it's a no opinion, they get a they get a refund of the difference. So it's submitted by Scott Catalog Value. You still have to pay the bare minimum on that stamp. Uh, or excuse me, if you get no opinion, you get a full refund. If you get if it turns out not to be the stamp you thought it was, it's adjusted for the Scott Catalog Value that it actually is. Either way, up yeah, or down. up or down. So and if you submitted it and says, eh, I, don't, I think this is a, I've been fighting with someone over a seven o two, which is a Red Cross stamp. You might be familiar with this. The individual swears that the it's a rare find of a 702A, which doesn't have a uh, a red cross on it. And yet I kept looking at the stamp going, look, I know I'm not an expert in this stamp, but I have eyes and I can see the red cross. <laughs> and then he sent me a very generous scan. I, I say generous because he lightened it considerably and over before he sent it to me and said, see, it's not there. And I said, right. But when you hold the stamp in your hands, you can literally see it. And I have two experts that said exactly the same thing. <laughs> so, but that's the fun of this job, right? So one of them is we instituted that in January of 2023. Uh, we added tagging. The reason why we had to add tagging, and this is a controversial subject that I will talk about today as well. The reason why we had to add keywording is because there were certain items in there, topicals, first day covers, where there was not a, an option to filter them out. When you use the hip stamp site, the thing that you do is you first filter out what you're looking for. And they were devoid of having topicals. I think that's going to get addressed in some time. But in the short term, the way that we address it is we added tagging to them. We keyworded them so that you could find them within the stamp store site because we know we have topical collectors that use our site as well as first day covers. Now, I'm going to tell you something a little bit later, but I want you to remember that we keyword first day covers because that's going to matter later. I'm going to quiz you one. Postage charges. So we initial shipping charge was lower for most orders. We had a flat $5 rate in the U.S. That is far too much. It's $2.95 now. Again, it goes back to we went through a process of going through a uh, discount shipper where we can save money and still be able to send it in a secure way. Remember, sellers first. 
we are shipping their property. We have to do this in a responsible way, not put it in a number 10 envelope with a sample and pray to God that it actually gets where it's supposed to go. So the good news is in a lot of cases, we've lowered shipping. We've seen increased orders as a result of that. So the numbers have gone back up again. And every time I think we make one of these positive changes to the site and to Hipstamp, I think we improve our sales as again, and it gives people to come back and a reason to give to take a look at us again. Have, have you publicized that decrease? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's why I said we've seen an increase in sales as a result of that. When we put that back out again, people said, oh, gosh, I better go back over and take a look at what's there. And folks, there's one example of that. <laughs> my first discount check uh, last week. Excellent. Excellent. And everything worked out seamlessly. I wouldn't have bought the items that had to pay five dollars. Were you crestfallen that there were no stamps on the envelope? I have stamps on it. Oh, really? Look at that. They like me. He is popular. I will say that. Internet sales. So let's talk about opportunities. Non-stamp items. Postal history, postal stationery, first day covers, event covers, and postcards are not necessarily searchable on HipStamp in the way that they were on our stamp source okay. site. And by that, I mean, you could search the description and you could pull information up. Who, who, who buys postal history here? So one of the things you know when you're searching for postal history, I like Cuba, like Emil. I also like South Carolina. And so when I do searches, the last thing that I care about is the Scott number. The problem is, is that we built a system designed to pull the Scott number, whether it's a stamp, an envelope, or a first day cover. So that's the thing that shows up first. Most postal history collectors will care about what stamp is on there. That's relevant, but it's not the most relevant thing. So we're already harming ourselves in terms of what's happening. So I want to be able to work on refining the searches so that we can do better in terms of returning those out. So the calls, imported data pulls the Scott number for stamps not the highest priority for collectors. The problem is that it doesn't collect any other information and it should. For instance, what country was it sent from? What country was it sent to? What state was it sent to? Those are all relevant points when you're talking about them. One of the other things is the year, right? Sometimes, you know, I couldn't care less about a uh, Cuba cover from the 1700s. I'm gonna let Yamil buy that stuff. He's got a deeper pocket than I got, but I'm going to care about things that are sent during the Republic era. So anything from 1898 to 1960 is going to matter to me. And I'm going to want to look for those things, especially the Christmas stamp from 1955. I love that stamp. It's got Santa Claus on it. How could you not love that stamp? <laughs> you like that? The first Christmas stamp in the world. Yeah, first Santa Claus, absolutely. It's one good thing to teach the dude. So possible solutions. Hip, span, hip stamp can expand their searchability to include descriptions. I think this is a great return, but a low probability. I'd love very much for that to be the case. I'm going to spend some time with our friends from Hipstamp this weekend to talk about that. But it, there may be, may be a number of technical reasons why they will not expand it. But if this is the this would be the first preferential option, and this would address everything because that means that what you've written to describe your postal cover is what we will then go and find. So if you thought it was important to mention that it was going to Australia, then that's what I'm looking for. Then boom, there it is. Quick question. Yes, Bob. It's received a uh, manifesto. That's <laughs> what I'm addressing here. From Ken Lawrence. And I'm assuming that these points will address. That's what I'm talking about here. So Ken and I had lunch on Monday so that I could explain to him what I'm explaining to you right now. We had a wonderful lunch. He paid. We had a wonderful lunch and we had a lot of discussion. Item number two is change the data mapping. This is the issue. Data mapping is what we call it. So that it includes country year and other details. We have to consult with postal history sellers. Clark Frazier is one of those people and Clark certainly understands the issue. And I think Clark can help us identify the problem. I'm gonna probably bring some other postal historian folks in as well to talk about some of the priority items that we should look at. So that we are pulling the right data and we pull that information over. You have 80 characters to use in a search. And so I want to maximize those to make sure that we're returning the best we can for postal history sellers. Last option. Now, you can institute keywords. This was Ken's solution. It's wrongheaded for a number of reasons. Number one, it's an artful, it's an elegant, and it's too, it's a it's a blunt tool to solve a finite, you know, to solve a serious problem. You know, you don't use a sledgehammer to put tax in a building. You just don't. And that's what this is. And so what I'm trying to do is avoid what I think is a very inelegant solution to get the one that I think makes more sense. So the data pull itself, that is pulling data of the description that the seller wrote 
is my priority, not keyword tagging from somebody else to say, this is how I would find it. That's the difference in the two processes. So I have to institute these changes. I already knew that, but anyway, so our resolution timeline is 45 to 60 days. The outcome is improved searchability for what I call non-stamp items. That's basically everything but stamps. Now, here's where I wanna tell you that I found this interesting. Because I was told that postal history was languishing, I think is the word that was used, and that sales just aren't happening. So I said, gosh, that's a great question. How are we doing? Allow me to explain this chart. So if we go from January 1st of 2022 to 12 19 2022, the last day we sold on the stamp store, which is an inherently superior system, according to those who criticize us. We sold 1,691 items uh, per day covers. This, by the way, has a keyword in hip stamp today. It was one of the first things that happened. But sales have been better. This is why I'm telling you that keywording is not the solution. And I have proof. Postal history, which as we all know is languishing, we sold 970 almost through the entire year last year. In eight months, we sold 1,077. Now, I will establish that I'm not a math major. I will establish a lot of things, but I can tell the difference between 970 and 1077. Yes, Matt, you're a smart guy. <laughs> you're guess, the engineer for crying out. <laughs> I would guess, though, that it's a keyword search. I would agree, but I don't think it's the best solution, and that's why I'm saying it's how it works. <laughs> But I'm just saying, I didn't know that that's not, I didn't know that it was. My solution brings keywords in, it just doesn't bring mandatory keywords in. Because I think that's a bad solution too. It's as bad as using the Scott number. Because you have the option. And you, you do, and ours too, the problem is, is that our site is limited to what information is pulled and posted in that 80, that 80 mm -hmm. characters, and that's what we're not doing right now. Postal stationery, we've sold more event covers. We've sold about the same. All in all, we've sold basically as much non-philatelic items on hip stamp in eight months as we did in almost all of last year. And I think that's an important point. Statistics mean something, right? I always document what I said, and I document what I believe. And I don't have to make them up. I can just show you what they are. But if the data ever proves me wrong, I'll admit I'm wrong. Well, Scott, were the dollars similar to? I mean, you've got the number, the digits of the number, but were the dollars similar? Well, I didn't pull a cash value, but probably in the neighborhood. I would imagine the postal history covers are always going to sell for more than, say, a first day cover does. Yeah, I just mean that that 970 didn't represent $10,000 in the calendar. I mean, I don't know. I'll have to go back and look. But that does beg the question of if something doesn't sell, is it because it's not searchable or because it's priced wrong? And the answer is yes, it's both of those things. And so we we can deal with the searchability side of things, but I still can't price items better than they are unless the seller is willing to do that. So I don't know what the root cause is, but searchability, it's sort of like blaming the rest. You didn't, they didn't necessarily cost you the game, but it sounds better than saying we screwed up. I'm going the opposite direction of that, which is I say we fix it first and then we'll go from there. Opportunities to consider, submission form. This is an outdated form that needs to be updated. It is something that we will do. Under the hip stamp environment, we've got to maximize the information we pull from a seller and that we then present as part of it. And so we need feedback from our sellers and from our buyers to make sure that we're doing this correct. Raise the minimum value. This is something that I want to consider, but I want to say it out loud so that people understand it. Right now, our minimum item for sale on stamp store is a dollar. How many items sell on the front row? Uh, probably about 50%. The question I have to ask is, how badly will that impact our sales? Because I know it's going to affect our inventory substantially. But the question I have to ask myself is, is selling a dollar stamp worth it? Because I still have to scan it, post it, describe it, fulfill it, ship it, all of those other things that I would have to do if it was a $100 stamp or a $20 stamp or even a $5 stamp. And yet the return that I get here is 45 cents. 25 cents to post it and 20 cents on the commission. 
That's it. And that covers my labor costs for scanning it, posting it, fulfilling it. And it does it. Even if I count the 1% handling fee, think about that for a second. I get another penny, it's like 46 cents. The same amount of energy as it would if it was a $10 stamp, a $100 stamp, a $500. So we've got to figure out the price point is not where it belongs. And we've got to fix that. Now, for those folks who are selling online that have dollar stamps, they'll address it in a number of different ways. Some of them will be to increase their prices. Some of them will be to figure out a different way to sell their stamps. That's okay. Right? We're here to operate a business. We're not here to subsidize a sales operation and do it by lowering the value of our employees, which is to some degree where we're at right now. So we've got to evaluate this number. I will have that answer for you by the time we pass the budget in October, but that is definitely a priority for me to figure this one out. Change the submission period. So currently it's 25 cents for two years. So we're looking at increasing the fee and extending the post appearance. So for instance, just say, you know what? It's more of a pain to take this thing down and put it back up again. And as Bruce is nodding his head, he's a big seller on internet sales. It's more of a pain to say, we're going to take it down and charge you to post it again. If it doesn't sell, it doesn't sell. If you want to lower the price, lower the price. If it doesn't sell after four, it doesn't cost me anything to leave it there. And so the posting fee does matter, but the length of time doesn't. And for me, I don't think you get a whole lot of benefit out of charging a reposting fee on this than you do for just leaving the daggum thing up there for four years, letting them pay a couple of extra pennies that they do right now. In the long term, I think it makes just more business sense. And it focuses the energy of our time and our effort onto actually fulfilling the orders and putting them up. The only comment I'll make is that um, like Del Camp, for example, there is a lot of stuff that ends up perpetually on there and a lot of it is junk because it never sells. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to end up diluting what you have in the store with stuff that just stays forever and never sells. That's a fair point. And that, but that's why you, that's why I go back to the second point here of increasing the minimum value. That's going to, that also contribute to cleaning up some of that as well. You're, you're raising the right point. That's why we have to seriously consider all of this before we do it. Um, Cause that's a genuine concern. You, do, you don't want a wasteland of stamps that really are never going to sell. So how would that if, I, beyond... if I may also comment, you might want to ask Hipstamp what their search functionality is like. I know other websites will hide items if they've existed online for too long. So it might end up being that if something's been on hip stamp for six months, they lower it in search. Uh, you might just want to ask them on that. Good question. Boy, I'm, this, I love having members of the board who know how to do internet sales. Yes, Bob. There's a question of what impact will changes have on stuff that's already been posted and doesn't need to follow? So that's a good question. That's the other piece of the business we've got to answer. And that is, say we have something that's posted that's below the minimum value. Do I let it stay there until it cycles out and then say you can't repost it no matter what? Or do I just say, hey, it's time for it to go, good luck. So realistically speaking, I think allowing it to stay is probably the, the, the logical thing because one, it's less work to pull all that stuff down and ship it back, it'll be less expense. You just sort of let it cycle through, but you don't add to the problem and it'll take care of itself over time. Yes, Melanie. Scott sellers still have an option to bundle their stamps together, like it's like five one dollar, they can do it set of five. And that's actually another way of addressing this, which is rather than having to scan five different items, we'd scan one packet and then put it up online that way. So that goes back to the same thing, which is I don't care how you sell the stamps, I care about what it costs in, in terms of time and effort. And that's a good encouragement for people to do that, to sell them in a bundle rather than as an individual stamp. Days and certificate requirement. This one actually for sellers has been somewhat controversial. So we lowered it a few years ago that said if it was valued at $500 or more, you'd have to you'd have to have a certificate already existing. PF, Apex, doesn't matter, but it has to have a certificate. I think that's been an encumbrance for some people because some people have stamps that they know aren't worth, even though the catalog would say $5,000, they know they're not worth that. And so they want to be able to sell them. I've got a guy who sells British stamps and he says, look, I'm... I'm going to sell it for a hundred dollars, but if you can if you're requiring me at a catalog value of two thousand dollars to get a certificate, I, I'm not going to do that. And so, what we want to do is be able to go back to looking at what the minimum requirement is for it. So, if it's cataloged higher, and I know in 
worldwide and worldwide stamps is especially true because the values just aren't the same anyway. So looking at raising the certificate requirement and then putting the onus on the buyer themselves to go ahead and get the certificate, you can get it for a great discount through the website. So why not? Uh, we can do the, you know, we have excellent experts that can look at these things, but it does encourage people to sell on the higher end of the scale, which is again, addressing this problem of having so many low value stamps and not enough of the high value stamps. Yeah, I kind of separate. Let me just you know, gone, et cetera. But it's peace. Of, it, it, I understand the piece of mind element to it, and so I do think that there should be some standard on there. But I think we've probably set too low of one. Is my, I guess my point, or too high of one, if you will. Sounds so it's like you're promoting convey on mTOR. Yeah. Yeah. Like go there on the side street. Yeah. I mean, there is that. There's one of anybody that's dealing in five hundred thousand dollar stand is gonna probably have some expertise to deal and not from what I see from that. Yeah. <laughs> it depends. Sometimes that's aspirational pricing. Right? <laughs> Eric, I think setting a dollar figure is the wrong approach. Why is that? For, for example, in the revenue field, their stamps catalog five thousand dollars don't need a certificate. There are other stamps that catalog five hundred and thousand dollars. It shouldn't be sold without a certificate. And a lot of the sellers either don't care or they don't know. It's hard to say what's going on, but there are certain stamps that should never be sold on dip stamp or eBay or anywhere without a certificate. And I think that's the wrong approach. I think that each field should. You should find someone who's knowledgeable in that field and create a list of stop numbers that shouldn't be listed without a period and solve a lot of the problems. If eBay would take that approach, it would solve a lot of the problems going on there too. That's food for thought. That's something that I'll talk with our staff about when we're done this meeting. That may be something we have to explore. Member benefits. This is the other criticized part of it. In fact, I have a member who swears I've said that there's no such thing as a future sales proposition, even though I actually demonstrated how it worked in a public forum. And I can only take so much of somebody's criticisms before I say enough of it. And so I did. My point is, is that there, there was a member benefit. The member benefit was we didn't charge you more money for the stamp. If you weren't a member of the APS, which is something we opened up in 2012 to encourage more people to join the APS by giving them access to it. The problem is that realistically it never materialized. And it only should only take a decade or so to figure that out. And that's what I did. Again, I know I'm not a math expert, but it didn't, we didn't see a translation of people. If they were paying 10% over the price of the stamp, then in many cases, they weren't paying all that much more money. Certainly not enough to justify getting an APS membership to save that quote unquote, save that money. We had 2,200 users on the site last year. 2,000 were APS members, 200 weren't. Period. 2,200 people. We're buying, we're buying for all of these stamps. So I do understand the member benefit was, uh, was a lie that's been perpetrated to the point where people actually believe they're paying more money now than they were before. That's never been true. You never got a discount as an APS member, period. And you're not paying more now, period. Whether folks want to believe that or not, don't care. It's just true. But I do think that there should be member benefits that are derived from this. We can identify an APS member online, so we should be able to give them a benefit. Being able to work that through our arcane system and hip stamp is a bit of a challenge. I don't blame hip stamp, I blame us, but there's nothing I can do about it. I have a 20 year old design system and I've got to work with it until I fix it. But in the short term, I do think there are ways we can identify member benefits, whether it's something we do like a free shipping weekend or something like that, where we can't give them benefits and give them an opportunity to enjoy being a APS member and encourage other people to join too. But it's got to be more meaningful than charging 10% more on the value of the stamp and pretending like we're selling it to our APS members for less money. That's dishonest and I have never liked it. Never bought from this before, here's your chance for free shipping. We found those the, those free shipping incentives do incredibly well. So like the tax-free weekends they do, you know, they yeah, don't charge sales that. tax. <laughs> All right, expertizing. So we're getting towards the end, folks. I know you're going to call get the hell out of here, but basically expertizing has done exceptionally well over the last few years. Revenue versus expenses are doing Pretty well. We are on target, so we're slightly below where our revenue target is, but we also have to be incredibly below where our expected uh, expenses are. Where are we saving money? Postage. Here, 
Donated postage does me a favor, a big favor, uh, because we can ship with donated postage and that because we don't collect enough postage from our users and we never will. And so Cheryl's pushing me along, so I'm gonna finish up. APR well income. The, the bad news is we're decidedly below where we have been historically. The idea that we paid off the debt means that we're not paying about $450,000 in mortgage payments this year. I will say this again. I'm trying not to break my arm doing it. We were brilliant to pay off this debt in 2020. Go ahead, Bruce. Pat yourself in the back, too. <laughs> if you look at where we were then, we were getting enough income to cover our mortgage payments. If you look at where we are now, we would be underwater. Substantially underwater. The commercial real estate market is panicking. You know why we're not? No mortgage. We're debt free. Now we have issues and we have problems, but we don't have that one to deal with. And the issues and the problems we have to deal with now are getting people into our space. So we had one unbudgeted tenant already this year, Pageant Business Services, that kicked me out of the old Center County Bar Association spot. And I'm happy they did it. Next, we have Solace Therapeutic Massage and Yoga Studio. So much more. Yeah. Not a massage parlor. <laughs> this is a legit business. <laughs> it's been an operation for 10 years. There have been no busts whatsoever <laughs> by local police. And they're looking to expand their business. So they're coming to the old Senator Corman spot, hopefully. Uh, Kathleen and Jeff just finished up the lease almost and then we'll send it out to them and get it signed and then we'll get them moved in as quickly as possible so that's going to add another twenty four thousand dollars a year to our rental line as time goes on now we still have the graymont space and we still have ucbh so those are two spaces and we'll talk about that in the rental update but that that's where we have to work on getting back up to where we belong but the good news is, is that we're going to get back to about three hundred thousand dollars a year to start in third-party rental income now this doesn't count the aps in that line does it no, that's third party, not the APS rent, which I just signed a check. So we're good. Yeah, I make a joke. I have to sign a check to myself every month to pay the rent or I'm going to kick myself out. So let's talk about core values. Our shared commitment. These are things, and I shared this with the board, but this is something we developed with our leadership team. And the idea was to sort of be able to explain what we should be focused on in a way that's digestible for people who are either collectors or aren't who are members who are not. And this is, I think, the easiest way to do it. But what you can see is that it focuses on demanding strong ethics, making sure that stamps don't go to waste, not to value them and put them in a warehouse either, but also that they're always back out in use again, that we're stronger together. We've got to continue to focus on this idea that no matter how special and unique every different organization on the planet thinks that it is, they're not. The hobby is not going to survive because you're the president of 15 different organizations and you serve on the board of 30. And some people in this room do. We are stronger when we are an organization, an entire movement, convincing people to buy and sell stamps safely, ethically, and on the radar of organized philately where you can actually protect them, not off the grid. We are not relevant to people these days and we have got to work on that. Education is our top mission. There should be no boundaries. Everybody wanted me to say geographical, but that's really not just it. For instance, in the course of having this discussion about postal history, even though I've spent thousands of dollars and hours upon hours buying and selling postal history and educating myself about what I am spending thousands of dollars on, I was called unqualified. If this is the well, attitude- you're almost becoming a collector. If this is the attitude that we give people who invest this kind of time and money, the minute they hear something like that, they're going to shut their books, they're going to get rid of their material, and they're going to tell you good luck. You have got to stop treating people who walked into this hobby like they're aliens, because you were somebody like that one day, and people treated you with respect, and that's why you stayed. And so that's something that I think we've got to focus on. Remain relevant. This is the hardest one. We are not relevant. We are adherents to tradition. By our nature, that is what we do but we have got to stop being adherence to tradition. We have got to start thinking outside the box. We have got to start realizing that there are people out there who will not ever collect the way that you did. And that's okay. It'll be fine. Because if you want the stamp market to exist in 10 years, 15 years, 30 years, you've got to accept that the way that you did it, the way that you got into this and the way that you practice it today, doesn't matter one whit to them. 
but it's okay. You're not irrelevant and neither are they. And so remain relevant means we have got to treat everyone with a level of respect because collecting is the preeminent idea. Next, we're gonna develop a strategic and business plan built in conjunction with the 2024 budget. Our objectives, drive the staff crazy. Program review, we're gonna do departmental review for alignment with member prospective needs. This is gonna be an ongoing process, but we've gotta start thinking about this. Are we doing the right things? Are we serving the right constituencies? Are we needing to add or eliminate certain things in order to move other things in there? It's not about eliminating benefits, it's about changing benefits to make sure that we're meeting the needs of the collector today. Technology deficits, these are huge and these, we need to be able to invest in those and we need to be able to achieve accessibility regardless of where you live. Build organization to meet objectives. So we're gonna to have to go through an organizational review, which may require us to change some leadership, change some faces, change some things that we do. I'm committed to that. And I think the staff is, most of them anyway, will be as well. Content plan. This is the biggest problem I have. We are not marketing, period, end of story. We need to be marketing, period, end of story. And I'm tired of asking for a content plan. I will have a content plan and it will be executed. That's not for the membership, that's for my staff to hear. New revenue opportunities. So we've been going through these teams and this is something we'll pick up on after the, uh, the show is over with. And that is identifying where we have money leakage, that is spending money on things that we don't need to spend money on and creating new ways to generate revenue over the long haul. There are actually some ideas on the table already and I think they're gonna to continue to grow as we move on, but this is incredibly important to me, but you'll start seeing the results of that in October. All right, so let's talk about the Kugel estate. Al Kugel, this is young Al. <laughs> Handsome young fellow, wasn't he? Passed away last year. This is one of the hottest things everybody's talking about. Al Kugel stuff. Where is it? Well, as Scott said, we shipped it all to the APS. Al and Dottie intended for it to come to us, and that is what's happened. Mostly philatelic, some literature. Some of it went to the Collectors Club of Chicago because that's also what they wanted. So the materials at the match factory, the release of the material for sale. Now, remember, folks, when you donate material to the APS, I either have to hold it for three years or I have to start filing 8282s when I sell it but I'd like to have cooperation of the donor in order to get there. So what was, what did I have to do? Get an appraisal done. Good news. The appraisal was done last month or last week. And that's in the hands of the attorney. The estate filings have been preceded. So we are released to do what we will with the stamp now. The appraised value of the entire estate is $1.8 million. This is significant. Now I know what everybody's wondering. What are we going to do with this stuff? Great question. We're going to proceed with the disposal of the philatelic material. We're not here to warehouse it, and I don't think Al intended for us to do that. He just wanted the residual benefit to go to the APS. He didn't want us to hold on to the stamps for him. So next steps, invitation to bid. So after gas, I'm going to work with some auction houses to submit, uh, and we're open to some other suggestions as well. I have one priority and only one priority when it comes to this, and that is, the most money humanly possible, period. Probable bidders. This is not a limited list, folks. This is the probable list of folks that will submit. Robert E. Siegel, Kelleher, Rumsey, Global Philatelic Network, Cherry Stone Auctions. This is the entire estate. The entire philatelic material. Not just collections. Correct. Anything, I don't think the literature is going to sell for much, and probability a lot of it's going to end up either going there or we'll dispose of it through the library. No, but this each is collection may have a different... Uh, that, and that's, I'm going to get to that. So, even collectors should uh, be given an order. Well, and that's what I said. Now, I expect there to be bidders, but let's go through the process so that you're everybody who's concerned that there's going to be a problem, there is not one person who's solving this problem. So we'll have bidders that they have to have an international clientele. No matter who it is, they've got to have an international clientele. Why? Many of the underbidders on this stuff were from Eastern Europe or from Europe in general that Al beat out. My hope is they're still around. They still have deep pockets and they still want to buy this stuff. So I don't want to lose those folks in the process. So first, we're going to accept all proposals. Anybody who wants to buy something or everything in this collection can submit something. Whether it's an auction house looking to dispose of it or an individual who wants to buy it, make us an offer. Is the viewing of the collection is only available at the APS? Yes, I am not shipping it anywhere. There's no scans or... No, not for the most part. Come and help out. Spend some time. Actually, <laughs> <laughs>
Well, and I don't, I, I don't know yet who's going to submit it. I, I put up some names. That doesn't mean there's a problem. So we've got Feldman or someone like that, who you know, has a great presence in Europe. I've heard their likelihood to end up bidding on this and selling this material for you is limited because it has to be somebody with a compass for head. Yeah, he both each other. Well, this kind of boundary, he, he, yeah. they would go. They're in the U. They're in the U.S. travel. Well, well, yeah, they, they must have agents. Yeah, you know, yeah. they they call uh, out their American agents. I just want to list. I didn't see any European. Probably one of the ones that I thought well, might have been. Global, yeah. Philadelphia. Global, Philadelphia. Or global, 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 I know Chad's D's listening, so he can put that quote in the uh, article about it. So all the all the proposals are going to come to the APS board. We're going to do what I consider to be a policy session where we're going to get us back and forth about either the proposal to sell the material or specific offers for the value of the material. And make some determinations about whether we want to proceed through an auction, whether we want to do a partial. I think this is going to be multiple auction houses or multiple buyers. I think it's going to take at least two years. And I think we need to be serious about this. I'll explain what we want to get to, but I, you know, I do expect that to be the case, right? So final bids will be in by mid-October. I want the Joint Finance and Audit Committee to look at them as well. So they have recommendations for the APS board about how to proceed with this. And of course, we meet in October, and that's when we'll talk about how to do the final disposition of this. For those of you on the APRL board, you may not be a, remember that we did this with Mason, and we also did it with the inverted Jenny. I think things worked out pretty well. Uh, when we got down to it. And in fact, gosh, we got more for the inverted Jenny than anybody thought we would get. So key items for consideration, plan for single lots to maximize return, right? One of my biggest fears is that if we have an auction house, you basically just says, sure, I'll do it. And I'll, I won't even charge a commission for it. The next thing I know, I'm going to watch a bunch of box lots go out there and I would hate myself as well as everybody else if we did it that way. This has got to be a well-developed name sales plan. It's got to be real. And we have folks who are very familiar with the marketplace out there to help us determine whether or not it is. It's not like we're all just sort of guessing whether we know this is good or not. Many of you have participated in a number of different ways with name sales over the last 25 years. So I think we're going to be okay. Are you going to circulate a list of proposed lots among the contents? I have a short list, and I'm waiting for the long list, and I'm perfectly willing to disclose it to everybody as an initial list to make sure that we people know what's there. We have to make sure that they develop a realistic timeline to avoid overtaxing the market. So I think it's going to be not less than two years, but if it takes longer than that, it's okay. Again, the idea is making sure that we don't tax everybody in the first sale and then say the next one comes up three months later and then everybody's broke. Commission structure. I'm not making an opinion on whether I think a zero commission makes sense or whether a full commission makes sense. They've got to make it make sense, whatever they propose. It has to be all of the assurances that one, regardless of the commission structure, that they're actually going to do the work to maximize the return and that the commission justifies the work that they're putting in and charging us for. So it should be up to the individual to prove to us that they're doing the worthwhile work and they're doing it for a good price. Other items to consider, two plans, partial estate versus full estate. I think we have to talk about that because again, I do think that we're going to end up with more than one auction house here. And so I wanna know if your specialty really isn't AEF, for instance, but you are very good at World War One political history, and I want to hear about that. That, I think, is a part of the sales point to us. U.S. and foreign marketing, they have to guarantee us that they're going to sell them more than just 100,000 international. Now, you'll get a copy. 100,000 sellers that are buyers doesn't mean that they're just a bunch of names on an internet list, but they actually have developed foreign markets as well as U.S. markets. More than one firm is probably going to sell this material. I am somewhat convinced of that. Because again, I think that we've done that with some of the other big estates in the past, the Bauer estate for one, where we did break it up into a couple of different folks that ended up selling that material. Look at that young handsome yeah. devil. Maximize realization over speed. Um, folks, irrespective of where I see challenges over the next couple of years, we are not desperate for money. We're not in debt. We're not in a crisis mode of any shape or form. So the idea is we're going to maximize the realization of this because that's what we want. 
proceeds to support the joint capital fund. That is my recommendation, but it's ultimately up to the APS board to decide if they agree with me. It will be what I propose because I think it's an opportunity for us to invest in a couple of different things. As Kathy noted, we uh, we take the proceeds and we invest them in, you know, we take estates like this and we invest them in one-time needs, not in ongoing business operational needs. But I do think these investments can mean a lot to us over the long term. And so we need to think seriously about that. Investment in AP, APC maintenance, that's our top priority right now. Um, as we know, we need to replace the roof on the original portion of the building. And so I want to make sure that we have the finances available for that. This could go to part of that. And uh, as well as long-term needs that we have for the APC. Sooner or later, we're going to have to replace the carpet. Best is technology yet? We have several, and so there are opportunities for us to do that. Again, those business plans would all be financed through the Joint Capital Fund, approved by the board, fully disclosure, everything, fully discussed, you name it. Most important is to honor Al. Al is a fine man. Everybody in this room probably knew him, met him, had an opportunity to spend time with him at some point or another. He was incredibly unassuming. He loved the hobby. He loved the APS. And quite frankly, he's just a great guy. And that he was willing to do this and that Dottie was willing to do this for us is very meaningful. And it's something that we're going to honor in a meaningful way for him, not just take his money and run, but make sure that we perpetuate Al's memory going into the future. And so those are all things that we're going to focus on as we proceed with this. Scott, do you want to recognize the person who did all, all the appraisals? I was watching a lot of it during volunteer week. Jerry Robbins, a uh, local dealer, APS member, uh, did did the appraisal for the family. Actually, he did the appraisal for us because we paid for it. But but it was a, a very thorough, comprehensive. He did some pruning while he was at it, did some organization while he was at it, uh, all under the watchful eye of Scott Tiffany. So we feel very good about the appraisal. Again, it may not realize $1.8 million, but we are going to work our best to try to do better than that if we can. Any questions for me? Thank you. Thank you. I may have missed it if you said it, but um, the magazine costs, has APS gone out and gotten competitive bids from different printers? And yes, we actually have the most competitive bid we can. It doesn't change the marketplace. We have the most control over the inflation rate in the contract that we have than most people would. But again, it doesn't change the marketplace. I mean, the cost of production, the cost of paper, even when paper wasn't available and we had minor delays last year, what we had delay, what we had in terms of delays was pale in comparison to what a lot of the people had to deal with because we were a top tier client for them and they treated us accordingly for that. But labor costs are something I can't control. They are going to be what they are going to be. Paper costs are same thing. It's it's the market price, not with a discount for us because we get a discount. But you know, we are getting the best deal we can every time we do it. And, and we just did this for the PLR. We also just did a bid for them to see if we could get a better price than our current vendor. Turns out we can't. So I like who we're working with. They do wonderful work and they treat us very seriously. So I like that. The more, the merrier. It seems like the revenue you lose from the decreased membership fee, you'll save more. Yes. Not having to fail. Yes. That would be. Yeah. Yeah. They say doctors don't have to You're very astute, Gene, and you're absolutely correct. Not to be a cynic, but it will, it will save more not sending that magazine out uh, than the difference between the two. If this works, then we can look at what Emil said, further reductions in costs to incentivize it even more. But I don't want to, I don't want to create too big of a risk in doing it right now. I want to start by seeing how the market is going to respond. And hey, if I get to reduce the rate two years in a row, boy, that really will be something. So we're going to start with $35 and see how that works. Thank you all very much. I know everybody wants to eat, so I will shut up. Board. Now it's the uh, APRL board's turn to vote. Do I have a motion to approve the audit and finance form 990? I'll put up pictures like this. Moved by Gene, seconded by Murray. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We have one on here. You're voting, May. I've got a couple of questions on the 990 for that number. Um, the APRL board votes in favor, except for two.
We'll do that. I'm still here. We broke for lunch as well here in the office. The next on the agenda is the capital budget and the rental update from Scott. As part of the ongoing process that we have, we've been presenting capital budget, focusing on major capitalized needs for the APS and the APRL. Our primary, our primary objective is to talk about maintenance and upkeep at the American Health Health Center, as well as being able to do some investment in technology. And we met with the Joint Finance and Audit Committee last week. One of the questions that came up earlier when we presented this in, in St. Louis in March, as well as to the APRL board, is whether or not we have the wherewithal to finance these things over the next decade. And one of the things that I included, as well as defining the estimates that we had, prioritizing the estimates that we had, we talked about tier one, which is we have to do these things, which includes the, the roof, if you will, for the building, which is we're protecting a lot of material underneath and would we be able to finance those things? So I outlined all of that as well as the financing. It's going to continue to go through refinement. I would expect it's something we'll, we're going to talk about at every meeting going forward, at least for a while, to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of what needs are. But other than that, I'll leave it for everyone. I did mention that we have another tenant that was potentially, we've got a letter of intent signed. We're in the process of finalizing the lease and we should have a tenant contract signed very soon, at which point we'll be able to get those folks in and start generating rent from that space as well. We still are trying to figure out what we're gonna do with UCBH, the two floors of that, as well as the Raymond space. We're probably gonna have to start thinking outside the box about how we work. with that. Any questions, you can certainly ask me now or later. Thank you, Scott. That does not require a vote. Next, I'm um, turning over to Melanie. We have two policies for the APRO vote. I'd actually like to stop that you didn't. Sure. Uh, you should have received in your packet today the uh, uh, development and management plan. And uh, you've seen this before in a previous meeting. Thank you to those who have contacted me with uh, any sort of changes or thoughts or comments. I sort of put those into this later version of this. Um, I do want to say, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that uh, a good portion of this plan was created by Marion uh, Mary Mills. Service manager, she and I were to get the sort of a lot of the nuts and bolts of this. Uh, we're heard about her ideas and are bouncing ideas off each other, so I just want to put that to the record. It's really, as I mentioned in my presentation, a little bit, it's really sort of something as Kathy pointed out in a question afterwards that it's really trying to get a handle on donations that are coming to the library and give people better, uh, better expectations in terms of donors, what they can expect from us. And then what our responsibilities are for the material once it's once it arrives. So that's really the, the plan that you have here. With that, I'll sort of turn it over back over and tell if there's any uh, further comments there. Scott, in reading it, I was wondering about electronic signatures a section saying that donors would add a signature that could be late to back up what their plans are for the donation. Yeah, we, we don't have this in, in this particular plan, but it is something that we will have in place for, for that possibility as it arises. Yeah. Any other questions for Scott? Oh, yeah. um, Scott, this occurred to me when Kathy made her comment about bullet points. So I review this and it to me, it's almost like two different things. The first is, okay, what does the library collect? What's their intention? What's their goal? And the other part is, what should donors expect? I'm not going to take things that are moldy. You have to sign things. I, I may sell it. It's almost like you want you want to have two different policies in my mind. That's a little way down the road, but you know, you because you want to give the donor something that says this is what we're doing versus. I mean, it's a lot to read for them, or you, you definitely need to make a bunch of bullet point, but you. you I think you could even separate separate these out. Yeah. Okay. But you know, here's your donors. Here's what you can expect as a donor, and here's our goals. You know, when you said that, Kathy, I thought, yeah, you because you don't want to give this to a donor. You almost have to yeah. look through and, and see what their job is. Yeah. What well, wasn't included in, in the package here is that we do have a form. That's the form that they were doing for sort of how much it or is it oh, all okay. use this? Thought it wasn't in your packet, but that's, in, that's what they would say. You wouldn't necessarily send this to them. Okay, that might solve it. Sure. Yeah. The, the marketplace of donors are collectors who are very reluctant to recycle their philatelic stuff. And they generally think that the APRF would love to have it 
And I think that's the understanding is that it cost us labor to process this stuff, and there's an inherent cost of space. Yeah. And it, it doesn't really get to that. Uh, and I do think that there's just, if we can turn in and keep some of this stuff coming in, the 35% of the stuff that you might want to get closer to only the 35% coming in. And I do think there is a little burden to the rest of Get in front of it and save you a lot of that. Yeah. You know, just think like some of these things that we've gotten donated, we've been hearing about them for three or four years. It's so much time to go through it and it's draining time. There's an opportunity cost. There's an opportunity cost for real estate that it's hogging in the middle. So it it just um it feels like it's a high priority to really get tightened down. It's sort of a marketing friendly version. Yes, we do want this stuff. We only want this part of it. Um, being repository for everything. We don't have to keep everything. And we don't have to apologize. You know, so I do think that there's some more work to do on this whole thing. Even though you, you probably do have that nice sheet that tells you about first. Mm -hmm. I just know out in general, the expectation is that the plan is to send it to the APRL. The plan is to give it to the APRL, and some of these libraries are going to flow. They're just going to say that they're going to you know, put it in a truck and send you a freight in the I just think that's just not where it's going to come down. We have seen a market increase in people that contact us first. I mean, when I started, we just had things arriving they almost daily. And that doesn't happen as much anymore. We still do get them, but it's much more targeted now because we have gotten yeah. rid of it, but still a lot more to figure out because. There's nothing, we don't want to discourage people from donating to us, obviously, but we do want to sort of have it more targeted, more focused, things we need, or things that we could do with something that it's not good enough. Your form in this the document that she was suggesting is written into two. It could be just managed by Susan Wilson. Just have her look at it, just kind of like let me market it as well, have her the Big picture things. Something in that process might just generate some more ideas. Okay. Just because that's pretty important. Okay. Pretty available. Is there a policy on uh, research material correspondence? Let's say a prominent postal historian wants to donate their uh, 40 year old uh, government correspondence over a 40 year period. Do you determine that on a Case by case basis, or is there a more of the case by case basis? Because I mean, I have one just currently someone who's fairly prominent in literature, put in military postal history, after the who his friend is donating his materials to us. It's just two bankers boxes, but I've asked him to sort of can, can you give us an idea of what's in those boxes in terms of the materials, which original notes, and go for something. And it really is a case by case basis because what I have to balance. But what we have to balance in the library is space that we have, as Kathy says, and research values. You know, is, is it going to be used? Is this something that we that, that has a research value? I mean, most things have a research value, but how often is this going to be used? I don't want to sort of just bring it down to numbers. Like, okay, this is going to be used five times a year or whatever. But I do have to sort of uh, balance, okay, here's the material, how often is it going to be used, and do I have this? The space for them to put that in our in our life is just going to be there as a repository because we really don't have a function at least that I've read that clearly states that we're a repository for you know everything considered uh for those other research we just don't have the capacity to do that and it's current it's in the space that we have we run out of space very quickly it is a case-by-case -case case and I try to consult as many experts in the field as I can and I receive something like that to say does this have research value for something that we should be giving away in the library or in the art? I'm involved with the spell now, you see. Know, we have the yeah. same issue. We yeah. have a bunch of uh, stuff, but I can tell you exactly how many times that people have looked at it. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. And, uh, what and that what was that's the issue. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that sounds like a perfect candidate for digitalization. So you don't take up the space that it's still accessible to researchers. And, and that is the that is something I consider. This is if we figure that it has research value, but it's going to, it's going to take up, uh, in fact, the gentleman who sort of offered these two bankers boxes said we'd be willing to give money towards digitizing it. So that I'll, that definitely sort of gets on my radar. Okay, that, that, that's something we're doing. Yeah. If we don't have to necessarily keep 
on site the original material, we throw it somewhere else, but have it in digital form, that's definitely something we, we would consider. So, uh, yeah. Today, there's no collection policy whatsoever. Uh, there's an older one, but uh, this one, we're talking about the last. Um, my fellow board members, I, I would like to encourage you to consider happening this just because it wouldn't be helpful to update it and then you know maybe even at a future meeting um Scott and Mary for updating it further to what Kathy and uh Kathy um but I just want to continue to have a discussion is this a living document <laughs> this thing could maybe do annually probably sure. it should be done there should be some flexibility. Even if people can't if they don't have to review and review. Sure. The, the tool itself, and I, I want to take it back to the point, which, and I think Mary and Scott have done a very good job with this, is creating a document that then creates a dialogue. The danger that we live in on a daily basis is drive by benefits. And that is a very serious concern. And if we want to double the size of the Space needs to be the yeah, URL. All we need to do is not adopt the policy today and it'll come. So, my objective is one is creating a dialogue with our community rather than just having them create their own expectations, create a, a, an opportunity for them to touch out, reach out to the library staff and say, okay, here are the things that I've got. We can facilitate driving those donations to the right place if they don't belong to the URL, facilitate making sure that they belong. Like I talked about with Sam, making sure that everything's got the best use that it possibly has. But what I'm really worried about is that things end up in Belcon, don't ever end up anywhere else. And so I agree. I echo Melanie's sentiment, which is really passing the debate. This is a great update to the policy. And it's by no means the last time they'll ever do it. But I think it's a tremendous first start. And I think Mary and Scott deserve a lot of credit for that. Can you put in the motion that it should be reviewed annually or something? No, how you would. Subject to being reviewed annually. Well, you're yeah. approving a policy, and so it could be tweaked without. You tweak without, yeah. You, I mean, that's my pause. Like you don't need it. You could review it maybe in three months if you decide. No, I mean, I'm just. It is an ongoing, as you said, somebody said, a living policy as well as being static. Yeah, and every policy is like that. Like we're reviewing some of those to update them too. So I, I don't think we need that in this. Do I have a motion to open? Melody, I move to adopt the collection development and management policy. Well, we have a motion from Tom with a second, Casey. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, the collection policy is adopted unanimously. Now we're on to the policy for the Dr. Kennedy grant. Are you? Yeah. So it's fairly straightforward, folks. For those of you who are aware, we have two current tiers when it comes to our our donations for the uh, foundation. Um, that's the APRL fund, which we consolidated last year. The idea here is that we take it from a thousand dollars, which is a patron standard, which includes a life membership and a, and a cruise and benefits, as well as the BUI program, which has over the last three years substantially grown in the number of donors and successful completion of the Louis Fellows, of course, is one, and Greg, Greg is there, I got there. So anyway, we're too rich as well. Ben was on his way to completing that, unfortunately, and thanks to Rich's contribution, we, we saw fit to, to finalize that. I've got the plaque, and we want to do a presentation in Mary at some point. Now we want to talk about doing a tier above that, and, you know, we started the Bowie program in 2008, We've reached 60 donors now that have successfully completed the program, and I believe that number is going to continue to go up over time. And so what I want to do now is propose a $10,000 tier that allows you to make an additional $5,000 contribution and make it the grant service. The idea that can really have a, a love of the library. And the way that we've structured this is, I think, to reflect how Ken would have wanted us to do it. The idea is to build it, you know, to have a table basically at Belfont that is in Ken's honor and then chairs around it for each of the donors. That is all of Ken's library and friends sitting at that table. Metaphorically speaking, of course, not literally, but that is the start of the process. And then we would have an annual engagement process with those donors because we consider them to be super investors in the library, making sure that we get their feedback, get their opinions. 
answer their questions. It's a good opportunity for us to connect with our power users and make sure that we're part of the problem. I can't say that we already have two folks who've completed that tier. So once it's approved, we'll have number one and number two. And the way that we're going to honor that is they get a chair, literally a chair, much like you would for a like university, get a chair at the APRL with their name bearing it. And then there'd be a replica chair that would be given to them in their honor. So something that they can you know, memorialize Ken and what they've contributed to the APRL. All the feedback that I've gotten has been very positive about that, including from the folks who've already made the $5,000 commitment. That includes Rich, as well as Michael Perini from California, who was on board. And I've got a third pledge that is on its way to completing it to the $10,000 level in Bill O'Connor. So I know that there are three people out there. I suspect there'll be others who want to contribute to this as well once they come out. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, can you explain the details of the chair a little bit more? Is this a folding chair, a rocking chair? It'll be a rocking chair. So if you've seen, seriously, if you've seen, you know, honor donors who've given to universities, there's a very nice wooden chair has their name and a plaque on the back of it. It's going to be fitting with the the core and design of the library. It's not just going to be a perfect table chair, but it will, uh, it'll be an honest to goodness wooden chair that you could actually sit in and hold people for it. So yeah, the table's already there. No, that also. Where will you put it? Where the other mics? Second floor. Oh, okay. So can you clarify if someone's already given five thousand, they only have to give another five thousand. And they can do it over five years. That's correct. Right. Like, okay. If you get a new donor who hasn't given before and they give 10,000, would they automatically also be? That's a great question. What we do now is so for the first thousand, you become a patron. And that's true no matter whether you make your way through the new program or not. And then you make a pledge for the next four thousand. So, yes, they, they get all of those esteemed honors too. This would be the third step in that process. You know, the idea is where we were successful in recruiting Dewey's is that we went back to all of the folks who were patrons already and just ask them if they would up their, their pledge to the APRL to $5,000. And many of them responded eagerly to, to that. And I think this will be true of this as well. So we, we're building that donor class. And so I want to just get them to invest a little bit more money in the library. That fund has grown substantially over the last decade. And I want to keep powering that so that we can have that long-term commitment to the library. It's, it's, it really helps underwrite the operation. And those exact funds go to what aspect of the library? So it is a line item. So we draw 4% out of that fund every year. It's a, it's a, we have a policy. And so we draw out roughly 4% every year, which is a best practice. And that goes directly to the operational line of the APR. So it pays for, it doesn't pay for staff because the APF pays for that, but it pays for the underlying operations of the library itself. Then, of course, I'm anxiously awaiting everybody to pledge their $5,000 on our sexual redundance. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> is this a motion by the yeah. For the library. Uh, do I have a motion to adopt the uh, Dr. Kennedy grant? Yeah. Well, you give the motion. Move the, do I have a second? Second from Gene. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Anybody opposed? Okay, the motion to establish the Dr. Kennedy Grant Circle is approved unanimously. Thank you again for supporting the library. Uh, next on the agenda is another APS policy, and this is regarding Aeropex, and I turn this over to Scott. So we talked about this in November of last year. Aeropex has fallen short of what a World Series collateral show would be. We suspended their status for 2023 along with a set of expectations uh, to be completed no later than August 1st of 2023. On exactly August the 1st, 2023, the chair of Aeropex and the uh, Arizona Federation of Stamp Club and wrote to inform me that he was planning to permanently surrender the World Series Collateral status for Aeropex. In this case, we don't actually, the motion is actually going to be to accept their surrender. And I do that because I don't ever want there to be a rhetorical point that we close the show, but rather that we voluntarily elected to do so. And so we're accepting their surrender of the World Series. There are There is another group out there that's working on developing a World Series eligible show for the Arizona region. I think it should have to go through the qualifying process, just like any other show would. And so with this, we're not eliminating Arizona ever from a World Series collaterally. 
but simply rather reestablish, we're going to reset the deadline, the expectations, and have them re-engage us in that. Um, and I expect to talk to Michael Ball, who should be the chair, I think, of the show, to talk about some of the finer points of what would be required for that at the show. So I'm looking for a motion before discussion um, that we accept this uh, surrender. surrender. Second. So I got Yamil and then Liz and second. The and question are they going for a new name? The new organizing group, or are you talking about the old? Oh, the new one that's being formed. Yeah, the proposal was the Arizona Stamp Show, which I talked to them about. Yeah, the honors yeah. of that. Even if they look at the greater Arizona stand show, it would be better. But <laughs> so yeah, just, where, where we get involved. So I'm I provide I'm gonna provide them with some counsel on an appropriate name that might work out at least acronym better than that one does. So <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Anyone else with thoughts or any trouble to go to a vote? Okay, all those in favor of accepting this, aye. Any opposed? Thank you online also, that was unanimous. Next, we have another APS policy. This is the William L. Welch Award. Scott, you wanna? In, in our last meeting, I walked through a proposal from the awards committee that would create a triennial award, triennial award to give out to regular contributors to the American Philatelist that don't necessarily fall under the Medal Award today. That is either it's a multi-part series that's spread over more than one year, or it is a regular columnist. And we have a number of contributors that write regular columns for the American Philatelist that I think they already be eligible for the award if we were to give it out today. I would find the, the award, I sort of wrote it in award language so that we get the proper exclusions of who would be ineligible for the award, obviously APS staff, although I think my own column is award winning every month, as well as members of the APS and the APRL board in their current capacity. So anything they did as a member of the official APS and APRL board, they'd be ineligible for, including if they're serving on the board at that time. So really, if somebody wrote something exceptionally brilliant, but they weren't serving on the board anymore, or you know, prior to coming onto the board, they would be eligible after they know, not the top. We did all the refining of the language. I also elected to name it after our one of our longtime editors, Bill Welch, William L. Welch, who was a resident of Center County, and I think would be the first non-board member to be recognized in an award setting, and I think rightfully so. He was a tremendous contributor to the American Philatelic Society in a lot of different ways. He was an ambassador in the community in ways that no one's ever replicated since then. I got he was a mayor, state college, so. He did a lot of different things. He was the number one enthusiast at Center County to this day. In fact, I gave a tour before I left this week of a gentleman who worked with Bill back when they were both at the Center Daily Times together. So for me, this is an exciting opportunity for us to recognize the great editor and to encourage more regular contributions to the library, to the magazine. And I give credit to Peter and the awards committee for coming up with this idea. It's a, I think it's a fantastic idea and one that I want to leverage a little bit in order to get more people to write regular columns for the American Philatelist. So selfishly, I love it. I also think it's a good chance for us to recognize Bill. If we reach a point where we feel like we can award it more than every three years, I come back to the board and we talk about the frequency of those uh, of that nomination. But for now, I think this is a very appropriate way to get it started. Peter, you want to make the motion then? Sure. I'll make the motion. Okay, in a second, that's back from the break. Um, in discussion. Well, I can just say as, you know, the generation that knew Bill he was deeply loved in our hobby and respected. And, uh, I think it's a great tribute. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed? Okay. And thank you online. It passes unanimously. Next is APS policy. Tiffany Fund Tears, also starting. Very exciting conversation. Uh, the APS has foundational fund financing envy. Bob Ziegler, when he ran for president and throughout his time there, really wanted to work on this. So this is a conversation Bob and I started years ago about the appropriate way to encourage people to donate to the Tiffany Fund, which is the foundational funding for the American Public Health Society. And I had two reasons to, to get moving on this. One is obviously the fact that I wanted to be able to do this. My goal would be to finish the work before. 
Bob's term was up, and I'm sorry about that, but you're still on the board, so I expect you to make the motion. Because I do want to honor that mission, and it makes a lot of sense. We've not done a lot of concerted fundraising for the Tiffany Fund. When I got here, we used to have something called the Tiffany Dinner. And on an annual basis, it raised somewhere about, you know, five to $8,000 a year for fundraising. I'll brag again. This year, our, our soiree, which is the replacement for that Tiffany dinner, raised over $100,000, which is the highest single dinner we've ever had. Don't get me wrong. You can still give me money for it. So if you haven't contributed yet, by all means, I will ask you for it. That means that the Tiffany Fund has not had those small donations coming in. But what I want to do is create a concerted effort to go out there and educate people about the fund and give them an opportunity to donate. We used to have something called a Tiffany donor. It was a fairly loose standard very weak in definition. And so what I wanted to do is create a Tiffany donor status so that we could bring that back. And then second to that is I wanted to honor one of our very important historic, historical presidents of the American Public Health Society, the woman who created the campaign for Philately, which is how we raise funds today, and honor her with the Clue Fellowship, which is something that we can then recognize Jim's contributions to the hobby and make sure that we forever memorialize what she does by making it an important way to give to the U.S. Okay, Bob has made the motion and I need a second and I've got it from Matt. Thank you. Now we open it for discussion. The, the, the funds are donated specifically have to be to the Tiffany Fund. So the Tiffany Fund not, not to, a, not not to just the EPS. So we have a foundation, foundational side on the EPS, just as well as we do on the EPRL. You can see that the total amount of the Tiffany fund is not as big as the, the APRL fund is. And that's something we need to work on. What are the current assets? Pardon me? In the Tiffany fund, how, how, how much? How much? Over a million dollars in the uh, Tiffany fund. Is it 1.1 1 .1 or 1.2? Or not Tiffany, in, in an APRL, APRL fund. Yeah. And then I think it's, it's about 780. In the uh, Tiffany fund, and the uh, utilization of uh, that fund uh, is there a particular policy? Yeah. Sorry, and you spend on spend of four percent. Same thing. It's on a four percent. The APS set up, the APS board, just like the APRL board, set a policy of how to draw down those funds and transfer that into the APS operations. So this is again a way of creating a permanent revenue. So it's an endowment less for the APS. Both the fund. Endowment exactly, so we don't ever draw down the corpus of that fund as we do with the APRM. And there's the long term investments, but I want to boost those. And I'm you know, I, I think we, from, a, from an endowment standpoint, we need to start focusing on that, which is something we talked about after we paid off the debt. So now this is an opportunity to finish that project and get it started for the APF. I think over time, this will give the organization huh? underlying credibility that. Outlast particular contribution and will have a very salutary effect on the overall position of society when you go to ask people for money, you've got stability, you've got fund which carries over and has a meaning above and beyond like the year ago. Yeah. Um, money that goes into Tiffany or the APRL. We're only able to take four percent out, but we are certainly we get huge benefit from the unrestricted ones that we can use right now for a roof or something like that. So, are we opening and publicizing so much more of these funds? Are we restricting ourselves from having operational cash that we can use? And is that a concern? One of the things that I like to brag about is that we run our operations without over relying on donated dollars. We do value the donated dollars, and I certainly value the, the unrestricted one. I think from a board perspective, we would too. But I don't think that I don't think that they compete for each other. I think there are different ways that people are looking to give a meaningful donation to the APS and the APRL. In some cases, they want to give to a specific programmatic way, for instance, the YPLF. Or, and in other cases, they want to be able to be part of something permanent. They want a legacy that they can give. And so we have to be able to have that door open for them in a meaningful way so that they can participate in that. What I found though is with, a, with especially with the Bowie's fellows over the last several years, again, I've gone and asked a bunch of people to give me $5,000 a person, which on, on average for the APRL is much higher than we typically get. But I think it's done more to educate people about what's happening at the library 
and actually generated more donations than otherwise. It does have a bit of a, a blossoming effect to it when we're able to actually go out there and promote what we're doing, but give people meaningful targets to shoot at, whether it's giving from the, the to the endowment side of things or to the programmatic side of things so that they can support a program of their choice, whatever that is. Scott? Sir? When did you introduce the idea of the chair? Because that wasn't mentioned when we first made our Ken Grant donation. That was something we talked about. I didn't have precisely the, the right answer to that. We kicked it around and we felt like that was the most appropriate thing to do because there are so many other things you get getting to the Bowie's Fellowship. You know, you when, when you join as a patron, you get your life membership to the library. You get to vote and participate in the elections for two trustees on the library board. For the Bowie's program, we added the plaque as well as putting your name permanently in there. So we wanted to sort of follow the spirit of the Bowie's plaque, but use the chair instead as a way of talking about Ken's relationship to the library. Ken was a big advocate for fundraising, even though he wasn't able to give as much money as I think he would have loved to be able to give. He was always a fisher of men when it came to the library, and he was a big believer in what the library could do. And the chair, I think, represents that, bringing that group together in a way that, that honors Ken beyond just this year. It's it's a very nice idea, but what's the upgrade for a lazy boy? <laughs> for you, Rich, I'll pay the difference. I mean, literally, that's my favorite chair to sit in. I yeah. love what you're doing. It's great for the library. Any other questions on the Tiffany Fund or the Janet Kluge chair? And then let's um, move that motion to a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? So we haven't defined what... What the threshold for Tiffany on the Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so bucks, a thousand bucks, uh, ten thousand bucks. So for Tiffany, it's a thousand, and for the Klug, it's five thousand. And then at some point, I'll have a ten thousand proposal as well, which will, I think, include a life membership to the ABA. Because we had that question after, let's do the vote again. Uh, all those in favor of the Tiffany fund with the new chair? Any opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you, those online, for voting. That was the end of our, our written agenda. If anyone had anything else vital to share or say before we go to adjournment, uh, we need to do two adjournments. First, we'll have the APS board. Uh, could I get a motion and second for the APS board to adjourn? Liz makes the motion. Uh, Greg makes the second. All those in favor of adjournment, say aye. Aye. Online, yep, thank you. That's unanimous. And now I turn it over to Mel. Um, yes, thank you, Shel. I just want to ask the APRL board members if any of you have any further topics to bring up. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Move, we adjourn. Okay, I have a motion from Rich and a second from Murray. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Thank you very much. Have a great show.